Okay, because it is already 1 p.m., so I will open the webinar. I will share my screen first. So, good afternoon, good day, and greetings to all participants, to all my teachers, my seniors, my colleagues, friends, especially to our invited speakers and panelists. Uh, we really thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, actually, this is the second webinar from the Incasium webinar series. Uh, we were conducting a peripheral nerve cadaver workshop, but due to the coronavirus pandemic, we have to postpone it. So all this Incasium webinar series will not replace the cadaver workshop. Uh, once you are registered as the participant last April, you will be still our participants. And when the pandemic ends, we will uh, inform you uh, to be our participant in the cadaver workshop. So we have three speakers today, two international and one national speaker, and we have five panelists uh, with us. So we can give the panelists and speakers one by one in random order. The first panelist, uh, we have Dr. Ahmad Imran. He is the head department of our department here, Department of Neurosurgery, Hasan Sadiqin General Hospital, Pajajaran University, Bandung, Indonesia. He specialized in functional division department. And then we have Dr. Muhammad Saiku. Dr. Saiku is the neurosurgery consultant, especially in the spine surgeries from the Department of Neurosurgery, Cipto Mangunkusumo General Hospital, University of Indonesia, Jakarta, Indonesia. He is actively a spine committee in the spine section of Indonesia Neurosurgical Society. And we have Dr. Eko Agus Subagio with us today. He is the neurosurgery consultant, especially in the spine surgeries. He is from the Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Sutomo General Hospital, Erlanga University, Surabaya, Indonesia. He is actively in the spine section as spine committee too in Indonesian Neurosurgical Society along with Dr. Muhammad Saiku. And we have Dr. Sabri Ibrahim with us. He is the neurosurgery consultant, especially in spine surgeries. He is from the Department of Neurosurgery, Adam Malik General Hospital, University of North Sumatra, Medan, Indonesia. And we have Dr. Ajit Ris Dianto. He is neurosurgery consultant, uh, especially in spine uh, surgeries. And as I remember, he is specialized in minimal invasive spine surgery too. He is from Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Karyadi Hospital, Diponegoro University, Semarang, Indonesia. Uh, as you've seen, we have five panelists from multi-center in Indonesia. So we will listen and we will uh, hear about their opinion, inputs, and discussions about the lectures that will be given by our speakers. We have three speakers, two speakers, yeah. International. The first one is Professor Mehmet Zileli from Turkey. If you are in the spine field, you are very well known with uh, Professor Mehmet Zileli. He, he was the first president of the spine section of Turkish Neurosurgical Society. He was past president of the Turkish Neurosurgical Society, World Spinal Column Society, and he is now the president of the Middle East Spine Society and APCSS. Uh, Dr. Mehmet Zileli has conducted so many workshops and lecturers around the world, and he was accept, uh, accepting the fellowships, uh, spine fellowships from around the world. 
And we have Dr. Satish Chandra Gore from India. If you are familiar with minimal invasive spine surgery and you ever heard about the Gore system, he is the founder of the Gore system. He is actively as the spine surgeon in Pune, India. He was the past president of the Asian Academy for MISS, past president of the International Intradiscal and Transforaminal Spine Surgery Society, and past president of the International Musculoskeletal Laser Society. He is uh, developing so many techniques in MISS, especially as I read about him, he is now developing the technique about no stitch surgery in spine surgery. And we have the third speaker, our national speaker, Dr. Ruli Hanafi Dahlan. He is actually the head of division organizing committee of this Incasium webinar series. He was established the spine uh, division in our department, neurosurgery department, Hasan Sadiq and General Hospital, Pajajaran University, Bandung, Indonesia. He is actively participated as an executive board member in a World Spinal Column Society and actively participating in Indonesian Neurosurgical Spine Society too in the spine section along with Dr. Muhammad Saiku and Dr. Eko Agus Subagio. So due to we have three speakers, I will promote one or two things related to our speakers today. Uh, the first one, I would like to encourage you to go to website of World Spinal Column Society, registered as the member, because as the member, you will have so many benefits, uh, like you can uh, actively participating uh, to their webinar and online course. And then recently they published the book about minimal invasive spine surgery. And once you are registered as the member, you will have the free online access to that book. So I really encourage you to uh, go to the website. And then please access the website of Dr. Satish Chandra Gure, because recently he published two books, a very uh, good uh, book about Dr. Gore system prim uh, primer endoscopy from this to stenosis. And the second one is transforaminal endoscopy for lumbar canal stenosis. You can access those two books online and it is free from his websites. So I really encourage you to go to those website address. And I will announce because those are the webinar series, I will announce you uh, our next uh, webinar. It's going to be the third webinar and we switch the topic peripheral nerve and spine vice versa and mark your calendar because we will uh, conduct it on September uh, 2021. The topic will be about the peripheral nerve entrapment on upper extremities. So we will uh, talk about the median nerve, ulnar nerve entrapment until thoracic outlet syndrome and those are the tentative speakers that we are going to invite. Dr. Debra Goroso from Dubai, Dr. Maria Pedro from Germany, and Professor Lukas Raslic from Serbia. As usual, we will invite uh, national panelists from the multi-center. And those webinars are free. But uh, if you are not uh, in our mailing list, it's going to be quite difficult to announce it for you. So... That's why we need you to register first to this webinar so you will be on our mailing list and get an update about this. So today we will have uh, three topics and after each topic we will have discussion. Uh, I really hope we can manage the time so we can have so many discussions because all of our speakers and panelists are very good and excellent in their field. So the first speaker I'll give to Professor Mehmet Zileli about the patient selection for surgery in, in cervical spondylosis myelopathy and OPLL. Please, Professor, the time is yours. Thank you, Sevlin. Uh, I will share my screen. Yes. Do 
Do you see my screen now? Yes, professor. Yes, professor. Yeah. Um, I don't know what what is the reason, but there is some uh, interruptions in the internet connection. Uh, I wish we can you can follow me. Thank you for the nice invitation. Uh, it's uh, I'm very proud of it, uh, and I love to see my Indonesian friends. Uh, and uh, the friends from all over the world. This this topic, patient selection for surgery in cervical spondylitic myelopathy and OPLL, is is very really very hot topic. Uh, if you look at the terminology, uh, cervical spondylitic radiculopathy can be called instead of cervical disc herniation. Uh, in, there is root symptoms and brachiasia. Uh, cervical spondylitic myelopathy is the, uh, is a result of uh, degeneration of the uh, cervical spine and with stenosis. There are spinal cord symptoms. Degenerative cervical myelopathy is a new term uh, containing CSM together with OPLL. Uh, but I still uh, continue to using CSM and OPLL differently. In the past, uh, my bosses were, were using soft disc herniation and hard disc herniation, which are not very appropriate. Uh, there are many controversies or unknowns in sur surgery for CSM. One is the indications of surgery. The other is the sur uh, type of surgery because the prospective control studies are lacking. But the decision makers, uh, there are mainly four. Site of compression, curvature, number of compressions, and the general condition of the... Of the you should better go anterior surgery. If there is posterior, go to from backward. And if there is both, then your decision depends on the number of levels and instability. The curve is, uh, as currently we know, it is the most important part. If there is a kyphotic curve, anterior surgery is better. If there is a hyperlordotic curve, posterior surgery is better. If the lordosis is preserved, then uh, you can do both. Patient's age and general condition and bone quality is also important. Age is not a factor alone, but the comorbidities are, are important. If, the, uh, if it is osteoporotic, the graft problems may happen. If the general condition of the patient is poor, better is to prefer posterior surgery instead of anterior surgery. There are different types of surgery, as you know, different discectomies, corpectomies, and or posterior laminectomy or laminoplasties, different types. The, ad, the advantages, the, the compression is usually anterior. However, the disadvantage with the fusion, uh, you can, is it all right? Yeah, adjacent level disease and the complication rate is high. Then I will not mention much about the details of the technique, but in the past, we used to do uh, just corpectomies and place the, a, a long graft and don't use any, any plate afterwards. To uh, achieve a good uh, fixation there, uh, we were trying to create grooves in, inside the, uh, the bone. But now it's very common that all, all of us are using graft pla plus plating. However, uh, if our corpectomies are more than two levels, the, the uh, graft and plate uh, failure is very common. This is so-called kick-out plate to prevent uh, distal uh, uh, failure. Uh, but in those cases, uh, posture fixation must be added. Uh, the graft dislocation can happen posteriorly also. 
If if it does, then it, it compresses the spinal cord, which is more harmful. So graft on the corpectomy is currently nobody does this. Uh, one to two level corpectomy needs always an anterior plate. But if it is three level corpectomy, a posterior fixation must be added. Alternative to this is the script corpectomy to prevent posterior fixation or oblique corp corpectomy to prevent any fixation. So keep corpectomy is like this, actually. You can uh, make one corpectomy, other corpectomy, and, and sorry, one corpectomy here, skip one. So then at the end, uh, you can provide good alignment, even some correction. Complications of anterior surgery is about 20 to 20. 25%. Most of them are approach related complications like dysphagia, hoarseness, airway problems, uh, others. But uh, if the if se second is the graft related complications or graft site complications, which can be avoided with the oblique corpectomy. So, dysphagia and swallowing difficulty is, are the most common. Uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy is not that much, one out of 355 surgeries. Neurologic deterioration is 1.5%, C5 root most common, but uh, it is more common in the posterior surgeries. This is one example of OPLL, uh, focal OPLL. Uh, we have Uh, if we uh, come to the recommendations, uh, what to do in case of uh, cervical spondylitic myelopathy, you, you can look at the site of WFNS Spine Committee recommendations on their website. Uh, surgery versus non-surgery for CSM. We recommend using modified Japanese orthopedic uh, scale, and uh, we can... Uh, uh, classify in three groups, severe, moderate, and mild uh, cases. Mild cases are uh, MGOA scores 15 to 17. Surgery versus non-surgery for CSM, moderate and severe CSM, uh, we recommend surgery always. But if it is mild, then uh, there are discussions. You can either do a surgery or conservative uh, therapy rehabilitation or follow-up, simple follow-up. Uh, if at the beginning non-operative management was followed, we recommend operative inter intervention when rapid pre progression of symptoms appear. So then non-operative treatment is considered must be considered for slowly progressive disease. Uh, if a non-myelopathic patient has also a radiculopathy, uh, we can offer a prophylactic surgery or not. This is also uh, not very nicely resolved problem. Uh, but we, we must inform the patient for having a, a, a significant deficits, neurologic deficits, after a uh, following a trivial injury, very minor injury, uh, can cause them a significant deficit. We must inform the patient for that. non myelopathic patients with radiculopathy are candidates who may deteriorate, and these patients should better go under uh, should better undergo surgery. What are the predictors uh, of worsening? So then we can offer surgery for those cases with um, a mild myelopathy. Radiologic predictors are circumferential cord compression and axial MR, reduced diameter of CSF space, hypermobility of spinal segment, angular edge deformity, instability, greater angle of vertebral sleep, lower segmental lordotic angle, and uh, presence of OPLL. And we now uh, realize uh, more and more the importance of uh, sagittal balance measurements as to in the cervical spine. Uh, we must measure SVA, 
sagittal vertical axis and Lordosis angle. Well, we must also uh, look at the T2 hyperintensity. There is a classification called by UNL. Uh, type 1 is a, bl a blurry or faint border. Type 2 is a significant patterns of intramedullary uh, T2 hyperintensity. Type 3 is a sharp uh, margin pattern of uh, T2 hyperintensity, which uh, means that, that this is an atrophy or gliosis. So then the predictors of worsening of non-myelopathic patients, clinical predictors is radiculopathy, as I mentioned before, electrophysiologic predictors, prolonged MEPs and SEPs, EMG signs of anti horn cell lesions, and duration of symptoms is also very important. Uh, and in my CSM, we strongly encourage randomized controlled trials comparing surgical versus non-surgical interventions. We need such trials, other, otherwise we will not be sure for which approach to choose. I will um, uh, also mention the oblique corpectomy uh, be because I, in my practice, I use very often. Uh, advantages are no fusion is necessary, no significant instability, and uh, no implant is necessary. But it may be technically demanding. Vertebral artery injury uh, can be a concern. Horner syndrome can happen, and control of the <laughs> compression may be difficult. As you know, this is described by Dr. Bernard George from France. Uh, this is one example uh, of CSM. I have done a oblique corpectomy. You can see the uh, corpectomy site on CT scans. This is another case with mild kyphosis. Uh, I have chosen uh, C5, C6 uh, oblique corpectomy. This is the Roots, I have done the, the compressions uh, with probe and post uh, films. In five years control, uh, there were no uh, kyphosis development. It, this is, a, however, th this technique is better to be used in cases with a, a loss of discites. Uh, so then uh, osteophyte have developed and then uh, in in elderly patients, you can you can make it nicely. Contraindications, indications are same. Uh, contraindications are posterior decompression lesions, instability, and significant kyphosis. If there is significant kyphosis, it's better to do an ACDF plus plating or corpectomy plus plating. Yes. But the most important is fusion and instrumentation are not necessary. And you can even do three levels uh, or even four levels. What about posterior surgery? It's good for, uh, uh, for uh, hypertrophy of ligamentum flavum or posterior canal stenosis or congenital canal stenosis. However, disadvantages are increasing instability, uh, Heart disk and anti are not possible to remove, and neurological complications are more in comparison to anterior surgery, especially C5 neuropathy. Uh, absolute indication, a patient like this, a focal uh, posterior compression with facet hypertrophy must always be operated from backwards. Or a hyperlordotic patient like this must always be operated from backwards. Uh, uh, this is a post-operative field of the same patient. But currently, we are always never using laminectomy alone. In the past, in, in elderly patients, in very uh, uh, stenotic patients with, with, with osteophyte formations, we were doing just laminectomy, but we learned that uh, Laminectum plus fusion has better outcomes and uh, has also uh, 
some advantages, especially in OPL cases, I will mention later, uh, we have these options, laminoplasty, hemilateral or bilateral or laminectomy plus lateral mass fixation fusion. Laminectomy alone may cause instability, laminectomy membrane uh, may cause problems in later periods. Yes, there are two types of laminoplasty, uh, unilateral opening or bilateral opening. This is more uh, difficult uh, to apply, technically difficult. Uh, most people prefer unilateral opening. Uh, this is first described by Hirabayashi, then the, there has been many modifications of that. And there are currently uh, some uh, special place uh, to, to be used with uh, uh, preve to prevent the uh, re-closing of the uh, laminoplasty. What about combined approach? If uh, there are, uh, I do sometimes, if uh, I mostly do in, in severe instable cases, but sometimes I do in, in a case like this, this is C3-4, the central disc herniation together with uh, narrowing of multiple levels. Uh, I have done this case, a posterior laminectomy plus fusion plus anterior discectomy and grafting. This is the postoperative MR image. There is a high T2 hyper intensity here, but you see the graft and very nice opening of the canal. Uh, what about the outcomes of anterior or posterior surgery? This is success rates are about 70 to 85%. Functional outcomes are similar, but complications are more with anterior surgery. What about the clinical vari variables of outcome? Age, duration of symptoms, severity of the myelopathy at presentation. This is a very important item, actually. Greater the age, the longer the duration of symptoms and the more severe symptoms at presentation, the more adverse outcomes can be expected after surgery. Examination finding, findings predicting outcomes are hand atrophy, which is not a show, not a good outcome. They, they will never, almost never recover. Leg capacity and uh, Babinski sign and uh, clonus. Radiological variables, uh, curvature of the cervical spine is important, as I mentioned before. Uh, cervical spine kyphosis predicts worse outcomes, and instability of the cervical spine is predict, predict worse outcomes. So, uh, other variables about the spinal cord compression ra ratio, uh, instead of AP diameter, this compression ratio is a critical factor. Spinal cord, cord atrophy cannot predict outcomes very well. High signaling intensity on T2-weighted images is a negative predictor for prognosis. But uh, the types of the, uh, class, as, as I mentioned in the classification, type, type 1 is a, a good predictor. Type 2 or 3 is worse predictors. Surgical variables, if the anterior compression is more than two levels or is a diffuse narrowing, posterior decompression should better be chosen. Uh, and the cervical sagittal vertical axis is one of the decision makers of uh, our uh, approach uh, choosing. In conclusion, if there is a focal disease, focal surgery, for instance, ACDF is okay. If it's a diffuse disease, diffuse surgery, such as multi-level ACDF or corpectomy, or uh, laminectomy plus lateral mass fusion or laminoplasty uh, can be chosen according to the uh, site of compression. Uh, for multi-level anterior compressions, uh, if it is two levels only, corpectomy is okay. If it's more than two levels, laminectomy or laminoplasty should better be chosen. For multi-level diffuse disease, for instance, the congenital compression, if there is no kyphosis, laminoplasty or corpectomy 
if there is kyphosis, car corpectomy should be chosen. Uh, with proper indications, results are comparable uh, with either corpectomy or laminoplasty. Higher complication rates with corpectomy, oblique corpectomy may be an option for selected cases. Now I will uh, talk uh, something about the OPLL and then uh, finish my talk. OPLL is not much different clinically uh, from uh, CSM, but uh, this is the uh, L ligament ossification. You can suspect it in the MR images, but CT scan is better to uh, identify that. that. Anterior surgery has advantages like direct decompression of the pathology, better correction of kyphosis, however, higher risk of CSF leakage, and difficult if more than three levels are involved, and difficult to go anteriorly if C2 and T1 levels are involved. Uh, so the options are anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, ACDF, for segmental OPLL, corpectomy and fusion for continuous or mixed OPLL, but with some uh, fear of uh, uh, CSF leakage, dural tear. Floating corpectomy is to prevent that if OPLL is densely adherent to the, to the dura, or anterior controllable anti-displacement and fusion surgery, which our Chinese colleagues have uh, recently introduced to the literature if OPLL is just as an adherent to the dura. These are two new advancements, probably. Floating corpectomy is well known. Uh, you uh, make a corpectomy and drill a part of the uh, OPLL and then release lateral parts of the uh, uh, calcified or ossified ligament, but leave it there without removing it at the end. Uh, and then you will expect with CSF uh, pul uh, pulses, the, the OPLL mass will uh, go for, uh, anteriorly and then uh, you will not injure the dura. This anti-controllable anti-displacement and fusion surgery has been first introduced by Dr. Sun in 2018. Uh, this is uh, a surgery that you perform drilling of the bodies uh, on both sides and uh, you then release the, the two or three vertebral bodies and then use a plate to uh, reduce them ventrally, to, to pull them ventrally, so then the, uh, at the back of the bodies, uh, vertebral bodies, the OPLL mass will then come forward. Uh, this is a new technique, actually. There are some recent series. Posture surgery can be done, uh, laminectomy and lateral mass fixation, I have uh, mentioned before, it is almost left laminectomy alone due to risk of developing kyphosis. Uh, and here, the key line measurement is an important item uh, to decide which approach to uh, apply. The line joining the midpoint of C2 uh, at the cervical canal with the C7 this line is key line. The midpoint of uh, at the C2 level of the canal and C7 level of the canal. If the key line is involving some parts of the uh, OPLL mass, then this is key line negative. And those cases uh, 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 if you make a posture decompression, the, 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 the compression will not be sufficient enough. So then you must do something to correct the key line. This is a good concept in OPLL management. Uh, for instance, key line negative, 
laminectomy is not beneficial. Uh, another thing, C2, C7 is sagittal vertical axis. It is measuring this axis is also important and it must not be more than 40 millimeter. If it is more than 40 millimeter, poor functional outcomes after cervical laminectomy are expected. So then you must look uh, global uh, sagittal balance and also cervical sagittal, sagittal balance and try to correct it. Otherwise, you uh, the, the patient will not be satisfied after surgery and the neurologic outcomes will not be better. This is a good picture showing that uh, this patient had both uh, a thoracic kyphosis and also SVA in the cervical uh, is somewhat in front. So in such cases, laminectomy and fusion uh, can be done and uh, even uh, some authors are using cer cervical pedicle screws to correct the kyphotic deformity. Laminectomy and fusion, and uh, uh, in this case, it's provided by cervical pedicle screws. Combined surgery, patient with kyphosis and long segment disease uh, should be applied. Patient ha having a three level corpectomy and posterior fixation must be added again. Which surgical approach for OPLN in general? There are some studies in the lit literature. One of them is from 2011 with uh, 27 retrospective studies and meta-analysis. Uh, the overall incidence of complications has been found 21%. And uh, the incidence of complications of posture approach and anterior approach is not statistically different, uh, they have said. Uh, but CSF leakage incidence uh, in studies anterior surgery 11.9%, however, in posture surgery, 2.7%, uh, quite uh, more in anterior surgery. Uh, in a more recent study, 2017, met meta-analysis of six studies uh, saying that uh, comparison of uh, anterior and posture surgeries, uh, posture procedure scores of anterior surgery was higher, but better, actually. However, anterior surgery had significantly more complications. Incidence of perioperative complications and meta-analysis, if it is laminectomy alone, 6.2%, anterior decompression and fusion, 11%. Uh, and the results of this uh, decision analysis suggest that anterior surgery has more perioperative complications, uh, laminostomy, Laminoplasty may result in superior long-term outcomes, and uh, C5 root uh, syndrome has been found in 5 to 10 percent of the patients after posterior decompression. And uh, this is a really good study. Uh, gradual resolution of ossification of OPLL may happen. Uh, this is uh, OPLL with posterior laminectomy and fusion. Uh, la sorry, laminoplasty and fusion before surgery and 17 years after surgery, a fusion mass has happened here and the OPLL mass has been shrinked uh, 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 than before. In conclusions, in OPLL, anterior surgery if one to two levels are involved, posterior surgery if more than two levels are involved, Outcomes of laminectomy and fixation or laminoplasty are similar. Laminectomy plus fusion may be more appropriate to stop the progression of OPLR. Uh, and non-myelopathic OPLR patients with radiculopathy should better be operated if there is severe canal stenosis and intramedular high signal. Postoperative joint scores of anterior surgery is better. Anterior surgery has more complications than posterior surgery. In posterior approaches, T5 palsy and axial pain occur more frequently. In anterior approaches, cerebral spinal fluid leakage, implant complications, hoarseness, dysphagia, and dyspnea uh, appeared more common. Uh, CSF leakage incidence in anterior surgery, 11.9. In posterior surgery, 2.7. 
floating prophectomy or ACAF surgery is are new techniques uh, for anterior decompression of OPLL, avoiding draw laceration. 14% of the patients with cervical OPLL require an additional surgery due to multiple lesions, especially in lumbar area. And neurologic recovery in patients with multiple lesions is poorer than, uh, than in those without lesions. Uh, I will uh, again recommend to look at our WFNS fine committee recommendations in our website. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Professor Zileli. As usual, a very excellent and practical and very good lecture. So now I will open for the discussion as the timeline. Uh, after each talk, there will be a discussion. The first opportunities I will give to all the invited panelists if there is any comment and questions to Professor Zileli, please. Stephen. Please, Dr. Ahmad Imron. Thank you, Dr. Imron. Yeah. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Dr. Zafrin. And thank you, Professor Zileli, for your nice uh, presentation and informat uh, informative uh, lecture. Uh, Actually, I I have a lot of uh, question for you, but uh, mostly already answered uh, with your uh, lecture. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, I have uh, uh, one or two uh, question uh, for you. Uh, the first is uh, about uh, osteoporosis patient. How to manage uh, this condition if uh, our patient uh, have uh, osteoporosis and the uh, second is uh, as uh, we know that uh, anterior uh, approach uh, 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 by anterior approach uh, the risk of uh, dural tear is uh, increased so if uh, there is a CSF leak or a dural tear, how to manage it? Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Dilley. Thank you. Uh, both of them are very important questions, actually. In case of osteoporosis, if you are uh, making an anterior surgery, <laughs> you must prefer an autograft instead of allograft. And you must add uh, almost always a plate, uh, mm -hmm. otherwise uh, it may fail. Uh, if you are doing a posterior surgery, if uh, if your construct uh, and at C7, you can uh, reconsider to go downward, T1, T2 level, uh, because it's a junctional mm -hmm. uh, uh, area, cervical thoracic junction, you can better go um, more downwards. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you are uh, experienced enough uh, for pedicle screwing, you can try pedicle screwing instead of lateral mass screwing mm -hmm. in case of osteoporosis. These are for osteoporosis. Uh, for CSF leakage, uh, posterior CSF leakage is not a problem, as you know. Uh, we can manage it uh, with some uh, lumbar drainage or other things. Anteriorly, it's a big it, it, it's a big issue uh, because if a pseudo meningocele happens, then uh, it may cause dysphagia and uh, respiratory problems, breathing problems. Uh, so. Uh, I try to stitch the uh, defect as usual, but if I cannot, I always place a, mm. uh, a piece of uh, fascia and uh, fibrin glue. Uh, uh, <coughs> adherence. Uh, and uh, at 
at the end of surgery, I place a lumbar drainage uh, mm -hmm. to have the patient's uh, CSF uh, pressure low. <coughs> Uh, and we, we, we manage the patient uh, for, for a week long with CSF drainage. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Gregory. One more, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, about uh, post-operative uh, surgical uh, collar, do you use it? If and if uh, uh, you use it, how long uh, you use uh, cervical collar? Yeah, uh, in ACDF or corpectomy cases, I use collar for one month only, one month, because most of the uh, graft-related problems happen during one month after surgery. I have shown you some uh, failure of the plates. In, the, in my talk, uh, all of them were happened uh, after a few weeks after surgery, and not more than one month. Otherwise, uh, there happens some atrophy of the <coughs> muscles also, which is not good. In oblique corpectomy cases, I never use any, any color. Professor, okay. Gary, may I ask? Thank you very much. Uh, what, kind, what kind of color? Sorry, sorry. Related on this question, may I ask what kind of collar neck that you use, soft or hard collar? Hard, hard collar. Hard collar for one month. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Imran, Dr. Ajit, and Professor. I see Dr. Muhammad Saiku is raising hands. Is there any question from Dr. Saiku? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Sileli. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, very interesting. I have uh, two questions. The first, uh, do you think the posterior surgery, such as laminectomy and or Uh, laminoplasty can provide good mm -hmm. long-term result, espe uh, especially if the spinal cord compression is uh, 50% or more. Mm -hmm. And in two years after surgery, the second, what do you think about the possibility of combination of uh, surgery uh, SSF in the caudal part of the OPLL with ACDF in the upper part uh, for three or more uh, level uh, OPLL. <coughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, in the first question you asked After two years, uh, laminotomy plus fusion or laminoplasty, are there difference? Is it, yeah. is it the Yeah, yes, both. Uh, laminotomy with or without fusion after two years, especially in uh, if the spinal cord compression is more than uh, 50% or more. Um, Recent uh, trend is uh, not to do a laminectomy alone. So uh, I will encourage uh, all surgeons to make lam laminectomy plus fusion surgery. Okay. Uh, although th there are such some studies that, that there is not much difference, but in the long term, uh, if you make a laminectomy alone, Uh, there are uh, two things happening. One is uh, post-laminectomic kyphosis. Second is uh, a laminectomy membrane, uh, which is causing uh, further uh, compression to the spinal cord. 
And in OPLL cases, uh, OPLL is is uh, getting growing, is not stopping. So for those reasons, it's better not to use laminectomy alone. But laminectomy plus fusion results and anterior corpectomy results after two years are almost the same. Not much different. Okay, thank you. Is it an answer to your question? Yeah. Uh, how about uh, the radiculopathy recovery uh, after laminectomy for OPLL if the patient presenting with radiculopathy uh, also? Is there the radio, radiculopathy will disappear after laminectomy or no? In your experience? Uh, yes. Uh, if there is a significant, actually, what I'm doing, uh, although there is no good evidence about this, uh, I'm also adding foraminotomies during laminectomy. I mean, I try to see the entrance of the roots in posture surgery. Uh, so, uh, and I believe in laminoplasty, you cannot do good, uh, such foraminotomies. This is one disadvantage of laminoplasty. But uh, if the patient has a, a root involvement, especially in one root or two roots, then on that side, you should better do some uh, foraminotomies during surgery. Okay, thank you very much. I thank you. And the second question, uh, what do you think about the possibility of uh, anter uh, combination of anterior procedure uh, of uh, anterior cervical colpectomy in the uh, caudal part of the OPLL combined with the ACDF in the upper part? Yeah. Um, this this is um, <laughs> this is not very common actually. Uh, you you should uh, behave according to the images. Then uh, you can make. I am I am uh, commonly doing uh, combined surgeries in case of if there is some instability in the lower part, but multiple uh, lesion on the upper part. Uh, so laminectomy plus fusion plus uh, anterior decompression with grafting and plating. Okay, this, is, this is something more sophisticated. You must de uh, uh, define it according to the films of the patient. And you must also look at the sagittal balance. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor. But maybe uh, the last, uh, what is the most common uh, cause of the CSF leakage uh, due to uh, OPL Alice? Your Take voice has the... interrupted. What is the most common cause of what? Uh, CSF leakage. CSF leakage. <clears throat> CSF leakage. Yeah. Uh, is to to iatrogenic injury or uh, the PLL is sticky to the dura mater in your right. experience? OPLL. <laughs> yeah. In case of OPLL, it is uh, very uh, common. But actually, uh, uh, a Japanese group has uh, uh, public publicated a published a paper on uh, defining the thickening of the uh, dura mater, ossified dura mater. So if you can identify on the CT scans an ossified dura, in those cases, you must not try to uh, uh, remove the uh, OPLL. And it, it is, it is uh, possible to see that in 20, 30% of the patients. If you look at the very thin sections of axial CT scans, you can see that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor.
Thank you. Dr. And we have Dr. Sabri Ibrahim is raising hand. Please, Dr. Sabri. Dear Professor. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Very inst- interesting topic. Uh, until now, uh, still controversy, I think. Uh, I seen in your center uh, for cervical degenerative stenosis, one most favorite your procedure is oblique corpectomy. My question, uh, how many level uh, corpectomy safe uh, prevent instability? And uh, how about uh, in long-term follow-up outcome, long-term follow-up? Thank you, Professor. Uh, one or two level corpectomy uh, with grafting and plating is okay. Uh, no, no problem. But if you make three levels corpectomy, uh, better you should try to the alternatives. A skip corpectomy or oblique corpectomy. Or if you are not familiar with them, you can do three levels corpectomy But at the end of the surgery, you must turn the patient and m- make a posterior fixation, lateral mass fi- fixation. Uh, what What was the other question? Uh, yes, I have one more question, Professor. <clears throat> uh, you always said uh, spine surgery for pain, not operate the the patient. Uh, operate the patient, not operate the film. Right and, uh, and uh, the patient evaluation of more important uh, right. than learning surgical technique. Right. My question: uh, uh, In case no good correlation between radiology and symptom, what will you do, Professor? Yeah, because of that, uh, we defined minor. Uh, 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 Disability patients, actually mild uh, CSM patients with the uh, scores 15 to 17, those patients sh- can 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 wait. Even there is T2 hyperintensity. If there is no neurologic deficits, if there is only Hoffman positivity or uh, Babinski positivity, but no. Uh, difficulty in walking, no hand uh, problems, those patients can wait. Uh, and then you can ask them uh, to uh, uh, to escape, to avoid any trauma, any minor trauma. Like you can t- ask them uh, not to uh, walk on the wet places on the pool sides and uh, be very careful uh, during driving and such things. So then uh, you can wait, uh, do nothing. Is, is it the answer to your question? If, if however, such a patient has a radiculopathy, for instance, in one arm, significant pain or numbness, that, that patient must be operated. <laughs> Because there is severe stenosis and radiculopathy. Okay, But thank you, Professor. Think, uh, one of the question of Dr. Sabri has not been answered about the outcome and the follow up of the oblique corpectomy, right, Dr. Sabri? I I think. Yes. It's yes. The answer. yes uh, 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 how about uh, outcome in long term follow up? For yes. uh, oblique corpectomy, professor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is similar to corpectomy. The, the simple answer is this. But uh, if you are asking about the possibility of kyphosis, uh, there are some uh, publications on the literature, especially from Bernard George, saying that. Uh, There is a tendency of increasing uh, sagittal uh, balance. I mean, some kyphotic development, 10 degree in in long term uh, uh, follow up. 10 degree kyphotic development. Thank you, Professor. Enough. 
Thank you. Professor, if I may continue to Dr. Uh, Sabi, yeah. uh, um, before we move to Dr. Ajit's question, uh, yes, Dr. Ajit, just yeah. a moment. One there minute. is some interruption in the talk, in the uh, internet. I can can't you, hear you well. Can you hear me now, Professor? Professor? So, sorry? Yeah. If I may continue Dr. Sabri uh, question, yeah. because the improvement of our health system and improvement of life expectancy, now we are more frequent to find those CSM patients in elderly. I'm so sorry, but I can't hear you well. You can hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Sorry, sorry, Sabri. Yes, Professor. So, uh, because now our health system is improving and then life expectancy is greater, we are frequent, right. more frequent to find those patients in elderly group, 70, 80 years. Yeah. So, what is your best suggestion to those groups? Because we sometimes doubt about the perioperative complications for those groups. Right. But for that reason, uh, I I have some uh, answers to that question in my talk. One is that uh, we can we we should prefer posterior surgery instead of anterior because anterior surgery, breathing problems, swallowing difficulties may be very disturbing for elderly. Second, uh, if there is no significant uh, symptoms. Uh, of the patient, mild CSM, so we can we can just wait. We 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 can just try some rehabilitation, uh, and we must also differentiate that from polyneuropathy, which is very common in, the, in those ages, and or adult uh, no, normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, and even Parkinson disease. I've seen some patients who has. In, in fact, uh, Parkinson disease, but has been diagnosed as C uh, CSM. Differential diagnosis is very important, and we must not be very uh, on the side of uh, radical surgeries in very elderly patients. Thank you. You are right. Uh, now, Dr. Ajit, please. Is there any comment? Sorry, Dr. Ajit. Thank you. Hello, Professor Jiladi. I have question related to the Dr. Sabri question, the previous question. He asked about if there is no correlation between clinical finding and MRI or other X-ray. How if we use uh, some instrument like radio frequency to pinpoint the source of the pain? If the patient only have the pain without myelopathy, do you do you suggest what is your opinion about using like radio frequency or uh, local anesthetic hygiene to pointing the pain? Yeah. Uh, if you are asking me a patient with cervical stenosis, significant cervical stenosis, canal narrowing, uh, and a radiculopathy, uh, I would not inject uh, anything to the root of the, that patient. I I will find it uh, uh, risky. But a, a root injection may may be applied to a disc herniation patient in a middle aged person or young person who has significant root pain. For those patients, a root injection is okay. But for an elderly patient with uh, canal stenosis, uh, with uh, uh, root pain, I wouldn't inject. Do, so do you hear me? We, we still, yes, yes, I can hear you. So if we cannot we still cannot find correlation between clinical and an MRI, but the patient shiver 
have a severe pain or radiculopathy what will we choose to, to help the patient only for clinical finding or we do something on MRI that not correlated to the to the pain but, but actually our subject is cervical somatic myelopathy <laughs> so then uh, okay, okay. The, the, the canal stenosis must must be there if there is no canal stenosis and that's okay. And then, then we must try to differentiate that root pain. Yeah, in uh, radiculopathy, but also from brachial plexus or peripheral, per peripheral neuropathy. Such differentiation must also be made. If there is no cervical canal stenosis, you are right. But uh, since our subject is cervical spinal stenosis with myelopathy, so then I didn't answer this this part. Yeah, thank you. Another question, please. With for for sorry, your technique oblique corpectomy. I just want to confirm that you do oblique corpectomy without instrumentation, only for an uh, oblique decompression. Is it? Or do you use some instrument on there? No, no instrument, no implant. It, no uh, post-operative colors. How Our many parts that, uh, that you, how many parts that you remove of with the, with your technique object? Probably one, one uh, third uh, of the body, one third of the body is removed. Third. Yes. The other two thirds are still okay. there. But, but for the section, we, we, we start from the, uh, by retracting the longus coli muscle or removing longus coli muscle, uh, we drill the uh, unconvertible joint, unconvertible joint, and we uh, see a part of the vertebral artery or not see that, sometimes we don't see that. Uh, and we go first to to the root uh, exits on our side, then to the other side obliquely. There are okay. good, good uh, publications in the literature describing it very well. I think Sevlin and other friends have seen uh, how I do it uh, during their fellowship times. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Sevlin. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, probably, uh, Dr. Eko Agus, Doctor? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sevlin. Uh, professor, about uh, C5 root palsy, uh, palsy from if we did uh, posterior surgery. What is the cause and uh, how we can uh, alleviate before? Sorry, um, could you please repeat because there are some interruptions in the internet. Oh yeah, sorry. About the C5 root Policy. Yes. If we did a posterior in, in surgical surgery. surgery. Or posterior surgery. Yes. It, both are possible. Actually, you can see C5 nerve root palsy, uh, both in anterior surgery or posterior. But it's more common in posterior surgery. Uh, how do you if if the question is how do you prevent it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. What is the cause and uh, how can we prevent from for that uh, C5 policy? Do you hear me now? Oh yeah. Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. 
I can hear you. Yeah. Um, uh, C5 root palsy is more common in posture surgery. And uh, somebody says that uh, the C5 root is, is shorter and uh, very susceptible to any injury. And uh, it's because of the injury. But uh, we cannot explain then uh, why it happens uh, after a week or two weeks after surgery. Sometimes it happens not just after surgery, but a week after surgery. So uh, probably uh, it is uh, uh, the, the C5 root is not adopting the new position. So then we must uh, leave more place for it. Because to, to do that, it's better to make a C4-5 foraminotomies on both sides uh, during uh, posterior surgery. This is what I'm doing. But even with that, I see sometimes C5 neuropathy. They are almost always transient. Almost always transient. It it uh, it stays three to four months and then it disappears. I didn't see even one case of a uh, permanent C5 root passing. Thank you. Is it the answer? Yeah, yeah that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Eko. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have uh, questions in the chat room. Probably you can see it too, Professor. The first question is about, is there any chance doing surgery from posterior only without anterior approach to correct the compression and alignment? In, in kyphotic cases, do you mean? Uh, yes, Professor, in the chat, uh, uh, chat column. Christian Beta asked about it in the generative cervical uh, with CSM and OPL and with straight neck or mild kyphosis. Is there any chance doing surgery from posterior only? Yeah, yeah. so called key line negative. <laughs> yeah. Key line negative. So, uh, yes, there are some, uh, some surgeons who are doing this uh, with cervical pedicle screws. You can make it, but uh, even in, in significant kyphotic cases, you cannot rely cervical pedicle screws very much because your uh, anterior support is not uh, very strong. Then, uh, so many surgeons accept, even if you correct the deformity from backwards by making small osteotomies, uh, with uh, small facet resections and using uh, cervical pedicle screws instead of lateral mass screws, you must also go uh, anteriorly and place grafts ventrally. This is this is the best way. But if the patient's general condition is not uh, uh, allowing you to make a combined surgery, you can. Uh, rely uh, mild correction uh, without doing too much. This is possible, yes. Thank you, Professor. And then the next question from Mona Fisha. You said you can do oblique. How do you oblique carpectomy and post fusion? How do you do the fusion? I think that was in your talk, but please answer. I didn't mention an oblique corpectomy and posterior fusion. Uh, I, I don't do it. But oblique corpectomy is, uh, uh, I didn't describe it uh, uh, in my talk. It's not very difficult, uh, but you must be careful not to dissect uh, vertebral artery, not to uh, injure the artery. And you must be careful not to injure the uh, sympathetic plexus, so then the Horner syndrome may develop. Uh, recently, I am not seeing any Horner syndrome because I am uh, pre preserving the fascia of the longus coli. The, the, the 
sympathetic chain is underneath the longus coli muscle, fascia. So it's not that much difficult. You must use a uh, high speed drill uh, and you can only think that the other side, contralateral side, the compression may not be very appropriate. You must, because of that, you must come from the uh, symptomatic side. If the patient has left symptoms, then you must make your incision from left and come from left. Okay, Professor, thank you. And then uh, another question from Dr. Finot. What is your protocol and approach to CSF leak in anterior and posterior surgery? It is similar with Dr. Imran's questions. The first question about the CSF leak. Do you have any additional comment for that? No, I, I place uh, always a fibrin glue uh, at the end uh, on the injured part and uh, we, we place the patient in lumbar uh, external drainage for a week. Thank you, Professor. Uh, is there any question you can unmute? May I? Yes, please, May Dr. I? Okay. Uh, Professor Mahmoud. Some spine surgery, the, some spine surgeon, they are not so familiar with anterior approach or oblique approach. So they do most of the case with posterior approach in more of the spinal case. What is your opinion about that? Uh, as I mentioned my, in my talk, if the compre ventral compression is more than two levels, we are so... Uh, recommend posterior decompression. But if it is one level or two level, uh, why don't you go ventrally? It may be a corpectomy, central median corpectomy. Uh, and uh, as I have said, uh, there are very good uh, literature reviews saying that the results of anterior decompression, the neurologic results are better than posterior decompression. Is it also for myelopathy fashion? If yeah. there is fashion in the myelopathy, you, myelopathy is, uh, anterior approach is uh, one of the best choices. Because some authors said that if there is a myelopathy, it's preferred to do from posterior. So there was an interruption again, the internet. If, if there is... Some myelopathy. I'm so sorry. But the your voice is interrupting. They wrote that. Okay. If there is some myelopathy for patient, some author said that posterior approach is prefer, prefer surgery rather than the anterior approach. No, this is not true. I don't accept that. Okay. Both both are possible. Okay. In 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 fact, uh, the neurologic results outcomes, modified JOA scores, are almost similar with anterior or posterior surgery. Uh, so there are many studies looking at this, but all are retrospective. So none none of them are class one or two. Because of that, we need more class one two studies comparing uh, anterior and posterior surgery in multi-level co compressions. In one-level compressions, there is no, no doubt about it. One or two levels, there's no problem. Yeah. If the compression is ventral, you must go ventral. If the compression is dorsal, yeah. you must go posterior. There is no, no question about this. But if it is multi-level, three levels, four levels, there are questions. We don't know 
for yet with with the high evidence. This is it. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice philosophy. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Ajit. Uh, Dr. Eko is unmute and Dr. Saiku is raising hand. Is there any question or comment? Yeah. Doc is it possible yeah. to ask question? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Very nice uh, discussion. Uh, I, I would like to know, uh, do you always see the dura mater? when uh, under your surgery for OPLL or sometime you leave uh, the PLL? Yeah, sometimes I leave it. If uh, uh, so-called so floating uh, corpectomy, they, they call it floating. So then OPLL mass is floating there, but on the lateral sides, are they are, it is decompressed. So yeah. then CSF pulse will then uh, push forward the uh, the OPLL mass. Uh, you can make it if it is very adherent to the dura. Uh, I do your, sometimes. Okay. In your uh, experience, is there any difference in neurological recovery between uh, fully decompress the dura mater and uh, just floating PLL? Uh, in the li literature, there is not. Uh, if I'm saying personally, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but in the literature, there is not much difference. But yeah. CSF leakage complication may cause further problems for the patients. Sometimes yeah. infection, sometimes other uh, respiratory problems, uh, swallowing difficulties. So we must be careful about uh, managing those CSF leakage. Okay. Thank you very much. May I answer? May I ask a question? Sure, Dr. Echo, please. Yeah, uh, Professor Slady. Uh, there is thinking that uh, if we put, what is your opinion about putting the screw in the C7? It will make a more aggressive uh, degenerative process in C7 T1, or we uh, maybe just putting in C C6 for that? Good question. If the uh, uh, is your, do you mean in case of OPLL going up to C2? Yeah. In any case. Yeah, in any case. Uh, uh, there, there are good compar comparative studies uh, looking at the uh, placing a C2 screw or not. Actually, C2 screw is is important because then the head movements will be quite uh, restricted after C2 screw. Uh, but in case there is a, a OPL alliance, even in the C2 level, you should better do it. Uh, and you should better try to preserve the C, uh, C2 arch uh, lamina and remove uh, just under it, underneath it. I mean, uh, like an undermining. Uh, uh, going downward is more uh, uh, challenging. Actually, if you have placed a screw in C2 and downward in C7, then better go down to C T3. Because then uh, a, a, you are affecting two junctions in the upper cervical junction, cranial cervical junction, and also cervical thoracic junction. But uh, th there is no consensus about what to do in, in those cases. Somebody says you can stay in C7. Somebody say if you are going down to C7, 
you must go more downward. Until T3? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I see. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. But then the, the patient will not uh, turn uh, or flex or extend uh, his or her neck afterwards. Yeah. Will have difficulty in the restrictions. Thank you, Dr. Eko. Professor, we still have about five minutes for this discussion. Uh, we can see together in the chat column, Professor, there is one question about endoscopic. What is your opinion about the endoscopic posterior cervical unilateral laminectomy for bilateral decompression for CSM? Yeah. Questions from Dr. Wisnu. Yeah, good. Uh, our Mexican friends, Jose uh, Antonio, wa uh, was uh, making a lecture on this. Uh, I don't, I personally have no uh, experience about this, but he's doing this, this type of surgery uh, by using tubes, but not very small tubes, actually, 25 millimeter or 26 millimeter di diameter tubes, larger. Uh, and uh, the laters, he is placing the laters after opening the fascia and some muscles. You understand me? Uh, otherwise, placing a key wire and uh, the, the laters uh, for tube insertion may be risky because if you push too much, you can uh, uh, enter inside the spinal cord. This is the main point. Uh, and he is doing like skip laminectomies, skip laminectomies, unilateral approach, bilateral decompressions. And he has shown us very nice videos. Maybe in the future we can invite him to for one, one of these uh, meetings. And uh, he is doing it very well. But not too many authors are doing this. Uh, as I know. Yeah, I'm not against this, but you must be very experienced. And you must be very experienced first in the lumbar spine, and then you can switch to the cervical spine. I'm also doing tube guided surgery for cervical microforaminotomy, but not for cervical canal stenosis. Thank you, Professor. Um, actually, there is another two questions because I have to be fair. I have to read all of the question. So the first is from Dr. Fakar. What's the success and recommendation for lateral foraminotomy with disectomy for just an acute radiculopathy at C7 to T1 and probably C6 to C7? Yeah. Uh, if it is as... Uh, if you mentioned my first slide on the terminology, uh, it, I have mentioned uh, cervical spondylitic radiculopathy or disc herniation. In a disc herniation, it's okay. You can make a small tube-guided foraminotomy. But uh, in a and cervical kind of canal stenosis patients, significant stenosis. You cannot just do this. You should also open the canal itself. You cannot just open the foramen. If the question is this, it's, it's not usual. But in case of discarnation or uh, anterior osteophytes, osteo osteophytes rarely causes radiculopathy. Mostly anterior osteophytes causes that. In such cases, if it is an anterior osteophyte, I prefer doing an anterior foraminotomy, similar to oblique corpectomy. It's a small uh, opening, seven to eight millimeter diameter, and then removing the osteophyte from ventral. 
If it is a discarnation, however, you can make it from backwards, posterior microforaminotomy or posterior tube guided uh, microendoscopic discectomy. I think our Indian friend, Dr. Gore, will, will tell about this uh, after me. Um, and the last question, I don't know, uh, it's quite confusing, but uh, Dr. Musa asks about what is your opinion on Dr. Atul Goel just fixing the facet? Ah, yeah. For, for OPLL cases, yes. He's, he is um, uh, advising and uh, doing a posture fixation in OPLL cases, and then uh, he's doing no decompression. Uh, actually, there is a conjunction of that idea and what I said before from the literature that OPLL cases, if you make a fusion, the progression of the OPLL will stop. Even some regression of the OPLL may happen. This is similar thing. Same thing, but I am still not on side of making no decompression with that. Why does he insist on doing no decompression in such cases? I don't know. <laughs> this is my answer. Thank you, Professor. So I'm very happy that your talk is having so much feedback question and I, I also can learn from all the questions and comments. So I think we're going to move to the second talk. Professor, thank you. Professor Zileli. I thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. And thank we'll you. move Bye. to the second uh, talk from Dr. Ruli Hanafi Dahlan about uh, cervical spinal degenerative disease. Please, Dr. Ruli. Okay, wait, I will try to share my uh, share slide. Oh. Yeah, can you see the slide, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can see yeah. okay. it. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, I thank to Dr. Selvin and all committee for this uh, nice meeting. And I thank you to our uh, head department, Dr. Imran, for coming. And special, uh, very thank you to speaker, Prof. Zileli, Professor Gore, Dr. Eko, Dr. Ajit, and all the panelists, Dr. Saiku, for uh, helping us in uh, maintaining the education in the COVID area. Yeah, my talk would be uh, a functional part, uh, and mostly I think 30% already mentioned by my teacher, Professor Zileli. And this is about spy cervical, spy cervical spine degenerative disease, and it's uh, the functional factor. Uh, Dr. Prof. Zileli already talked much, uh, very much and clear about the surgery itself and i will try to uh, talk about a part that uh, it's not mentioned before yeah the generative disease of the cervical spine is uh, unique uh, i like it and i hate it at the same time because uh, for the generative disease of cervical spine is very different with the tumor if we are trying to working up for the spine tumor we are depend on the imaging. So maybe the statement that don't treat the uh, film, but treat the patient, it's uh, it's quite uh, not true because the, the tumor already there in, inside the MRI. But in uh, spine degenerative disease, uh, there will be a symptom. Uh, the sign, the, the sign, uh, then the symptom is different than in this in this disease. Uh, symptom is very very uh, prominent, and you must be very sharp to uh, deal with it because uh, most of the this disease is not curable by surgery. 
uh, 80% of patient like this in our clinic uh, uh, me Dr. Seflin and Dr. Lucas is not going undergo surgery for the uh, short term and this is uh, the characteristic of the disease uh, developed in aging most commonly present with pain and combination with other symptoms most of it the treatment option is range from a to z from surgery to conservative pain management and the surgery also we have so many technique and approach and it's very common but commonly asymptomatic uh, some lecture some journal said that after uh, 25 years old the degenerative process is already developed and this is about the term, uh, some might say uh, cervical, cervical dissemination, cervical degenerative disc disease or 3D, cervical spondylosis and cervical OPLL. But it's the second, third and the fourth is have the same disease. It's just different term. Uh, Professor Zireli already mentioned about it. And sorry, I cannot move the slide. Yeah, and then uh, this is the different cervical disherniation is secondary stress to an annulus of this most often postrolateral decreased water protrusion content and what happened is protrusion, extrusion, and sequestration. But the the other one is spondylosis. So if it's involved not only the disc, we can call it spondylosis. Uh, the spondylosis is much more diffuse, like Professor Gilelli said, and it's a wide, wide uh, influence of all the structure in that area. It's a decreased cross-linking of collagen, decreased blood supply to outer annulus, uh, lactate, significantly increase and make more destruction, further degenerate chronic tearing throughout the annulus and combined with osteophyte and the irreversible degenerative cycle. Radiating pain, stenosis, and develop to myelopathy, complex myelopathy. And this is the Thompson disc degeneration staging one to five. We can see that uh, the difference between uh, the degeneration itself and what happened in this spondylosis is irre irreversible degenerative cycle. Uh, so called as this degeneration at the first and then uh, you can see joint degeneration like facet arthrosis, uncinated spurring, and you can see that in the X-ray, plain X-ray, ligamentous alteration, flavum hypertrophy, flavum thickening, spinal deformity, and uh, central stenosis developed to myelopathy. And this is the uh, symptom classification. Uh, we can uh, we must uh, divide the. Uh, symptoms first at the first time. So when we dealing with a uh, cervical tumor, uh, the imaging is play a role because that's an uh, objective uh, sign to do such a surgery or not. But in uh, degenerative disease, uh, it's very subjective and it's very biased. Like Professor Zile said that uh, much more patient uh, is not in operation that much. So there will be uh, three uh, wide uh, symptom, uh, axial pain, radiculopathy, and myelopathy. Uh, axial pain is etiology from inflammation, tears around the intervertebral disc. There will be central neck pain uh, with or without referral pain. And then uh, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't mean we need to do the surgery at this uh, part. Radiculopathy is a compression and inflammation of nerve root and definitely it needs uh, surgery. And myelopathy, of course, it's uh, mandatory for doing the uh, surgery itself. Some might uh, show the imaging. Uh, there's a compression or canal stenosis uh, in the imaging, but in a clinical condition, the patient still fine. I've, uh, we, we have seen so many uh, stenosis, more than 30%, but the patient still okay, only feel uh, in, um, uncomfortable at the neck. If we use the indication for surgery based on imaging only, we have to do the surgery, but the, sometimes the patient is still uh, very okay. So we have to think uh, more about it. 
and this is another classification uh, about the clinical condition we divide into discogenic axial pain with or without referred pain and then the second is this herniation with cost radiculopathy or myelopathy and then the cervical spondylosis cost radiculopathy or myelopathy and uh, this is the uh, difference between uh, the epidemiology you can see that uh, uh, cervical spondylosis as a syndrome it's very huge and very wide and it's uh, involve every structure inside of it and it's mostly happened uh, more than uh, 50 even though uh, in our practice uh, we can see uh, cervical spondylosis less than uh, 50 years old and then sex male more than female its onset was insidious uh, neck and arm in the question of the pain so uh, it's a warning if you know, the pain is in arm and neck at the same time it's uh, we have to ask ourselves if it's a uh, cervical spondylosis only or axial pain and then uh, neck stiffness is uh, always there mostly there i mean uh, myelopathy is more common because it's happened uh, canalis stenosis happened in the cervical spondylosis and the distribution of dermatome of course multiple because the central uh, stenosis which already happened and uh, i think uh, when i was learning from so many teachers including professor zileli himself uh, we don't judge at the, this kind of patient because uh, the difference is this patient uh, happened sorry uh, my battery is running out i need to put the give me uh, 10 seconds to put my uh, elect laptop to electricity i'm sorry Yeah, okay, if you uh, dealing with this, uh, it's happened to me also when I previously, uh, yes, a young neurosurgeon, do not judge at this kind of, uh, because the false positive from the imaging is very high in uh, degenerative of cervical. And all the patient most commonly may be said to be normal and they will think it's a normal, but uh, they, not realize they didn't realize that they are adapt they already adapted to the pain itself and management must aim at long-term benefit so uh, i don't i'm not against the short-term benefit like uh, pain management but uh, i don't think uh, pain management as a short term is uh, appropriate if uh, we can see the objective sign and subjective sign it's uh, in the patient so still uh, management uh, must aim at the long-term benefit uh, many of these patients do not seek the health care because it's uh, the psychological relation also quite high in this pain, neck pain so uh, we have to very very careful and we have to keep clear mind and think clearly and it's not we will, we cannot be uh, influenced by the what patient said but but we have to really uh, understand the, the the what is the main problem of the pain cell now there was uh, five classification of basic pain in neck pain as it's called somatic pain it's come from musculoskeletal tissue and then radicular pain from nerve root and then a combined state of uh, both somatic and radicular pain and the first one will it will give uh, inflammation also and central pain come from the central nervous system and the last was visceral pain from visceral organs uh, this is need to be differenti differentiated uh, earliest at the beginning uh, and and uh, EMG will help. Uh, I think I don't know about uh, other, but uh, in our center, uh, EMG uh, help uh, to I mean uh, to focus on which level the radicular pain is came. 
And then this is a cervical radiculopathy. It's characteristic with dermatomal pain distribution. It will give spooling sign positive and shoulder abduction relief sign positive. And the second is the nerve root di distribution will give a numbness and paresthesia. So this is the cervical radiculopathy. And cervical myopathy is much more uh, severe uh, and uh, on uh, in uh, contrastly uh, the pain will absent in cervical myelopathy so uh, if the pain already absent it's it's mean that the myelopathy is already developed in the next level and uh, pain absent usually will give uh, some discomfort varies including uh, feel numbness or not good uh, or in inside of uh, in front of the their neck and cannot maintain the good position in uh, when sit or when uh, standing. Uh, and prominent symptom would be uh, would be white ataxic guide pattern and poor hand dexterity. Poor hand dexterity, the patient cannot buttoning the shirt, uh, cannot holding onto coffee coffee mug well, and uh, difficult to uh, coordinate in writing. And other physical finding myopathy, it's. Uh, Many, it's a uh, hyperreflexia, positive Hoffman sign, in fact, brachial reflex, positive Bobinis kind uh, will present, and there meet the sign present, and uh, myelopathic hand syndrome. Uh, it's include the tenor atrophy, uh, positive finger escape sign, positive grip release test at the palm, and misia the whole kinesia. Uh, diagnostic imaging, including uh, brain radiograph, CT myelography, and MRI, but it's not a choice. Uh, each procedure has uh, its own benefit. Uh, so it doesn't mean that if we do already do MRI, so we don't have to do plain uh, radiograph because it's complete each other. Uh, Plain radiograph uh, in spondylosis may have a loss of lobe doses of spondylostasis, and we can see the narrowing of the intervertebral disc space. We can see the OPLL, like a uh, slight uh, case in Professor Zileli presentation. We can see osteophyte uh, clearly. We can see the degenerative changes in this joint, Ziga official joints. And uh, osteophyte can seen in in uh, so many way. Uh, I mean, uh, it it will clearly uh, show the the position of osteophyte. And then foramina rolling uh, is observed on oblique view, so we can do uh, oblique view lateral and AP. And CT myelography, it's different thing. Uh, this uh, alternative uh, or choice when we cannot do uh, an MRI, but it's uh, not much uh, functional in the generative, uh, at least, uh, uh, except if they're already uh, myelopathy, and it will give a uh, benefit. And MRI, MRI is uh, still the best to give the imaging. Uh, there will be, uh, the, uh, we can see all the soft tissue, soft structure, because we, we both we all know that the uh, the spine and the cord and uh, only uh, the 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 bone or from the spine are best with X-ray, and the others is uh, can only be uh, ruled out by MRI. But still, in this disease, different with the tumor because in this disease. Correlation with clinical symptom is still critical. Like I said before, the false positive rate of the imaging, it's the generative disease is very high. Uh, treatment for radiculopathy is conservative treatment. Uh, we both, uh, we all know this, uh, 70 to 80% successful in two or three months. So in our practice, uh, my practice with Dr. Seflin and Dr. Lucas, we, we like to, if the symptom is not that prominent, we like to delay the patient two or three months uh, before come back to us again and we uh, can uh, evaluate more and we can give the patient time to, to do the daily uh, practice, daily activity, uh, 
good diet uh, or uh, good rest, steroid, anti-inflammation, and other modality. And uh, axial pain uh, of without radiculopathy should be treated conservatively as long as possible because surgical results are less predictable. And it is true. It is true. Uh, axial pain is uh, from what I've seen, uh, from, I mean, from my experience, uh, axial pain uh, done to hurry by surgery will just give more uh, instability to the patient. And you don't want to feel that way. Uh, operative indication is uh, given for progressive sign of root or core dysfunction and uh, failure of conservative treatment in relieving radicular pain or neurological deficit in two or three months so we have time to uh, observe it's not an e it is not a it's not a sudden surgery uh, emergency surgery operative indication uh, if continuing or worsening symptom and then failure about three to four months usually we use two months and then surgery typically avoid for isolated axial neck pain. Uh, Andreas surgical indication is central disc herniation. This is already uh, uh, mentioned uh, very complete by Professor Zileli. Central disc herniation, foraminal stenosis, anterior osteophyte, and spondylitic myopathy. Then, uh, and posterior surgical intervention indication was disc herniation and uh, OPL. This is the indications of anterior cervical surgery, central soft disc herniation, bilateral radiculopathy at the same level, unilateral or soft disc or unilateral foraminal stenosis by uh, oblique perpectomy, significant neck pain in addition to radiculopathy, one or two levels spondylic myopathy and hypotic sag sagittal uh, alignment. This is uh, just a sample of our uh, case. And... I will skip this. Uh, yeah, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion is allograph that may be used for fusion instrumentation. No ideal trace the upside morbidity and the recombinant human bone, morphogenetic protein 2 was used as a label on allograph uh, in the anterior cervical spine. Interbody cage device. Uh, Personally, uh, I, I I don't uh, it's uh, I don't have any relation with the third party, but uh, I like the most uh, peak cage as an interbody cage device, uh, and uh, I we 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 don't uh, prefer uh, artificial this because uh, artificial this is uh, not. Uh, giving a good fusion, so uh, I uh, oh, prefer interbody cage device. It can hold graph material. Uh, structural stability is much better. It will maintain the foraminal height. Titanium and carbon uh, will populate, but peak cage uh, are subsequently introduced. But uh, it's it's getting popular now, and uh, in our uh, practice, we use uh, peak cage for distraction. Uh, uh, the the narrowing uh, intervertebral foramen. Uh, yeah. Single level interbody fusion is quite stable and fusion rate are excellent. No need for operative bracing. Uh, but uh, I, I I heard Professor Zileli mention about uh, one month uh, after surgery we'll use uh, cervical bracing. At its, it's I think it's it's better. Uh, but uh, some, some, sometimes we use only two weeks because the patient, uh, some patient uh, cannot uh, be disciplined in using a collar in uh, one month or more. And uh, another is anterior, anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion. Uh, this is uh, uh, use an uh, expandable cage uh, already mentioned all by Professor Zilis, I will just skip. And the other was cervical disarthroplasty, uh, which is uh, 
this uh, emotion preserving surgery and uh, the goal is not the, the fusion only and uh, it's not recommended for the spon uh, spondylosis uh, syndrome and this is a posterior cervical surgery indication uh, unilateral of this herniation of or foraminal stenosis in patient with radiculopathy with no significant axial symptoms and uh, of course we have to see the alignment of the lordotic uh, position before the surgery and then second cer cervical spondylitic myelopathy if it's more than three level of pathology and then ossific uh, OPLL and uh, in a patient with a natural or lumbotic sagittal alignment so it's not uh, it's it's contraindication for the kypotic or uh, tend to kypotic uh, alignment laminoforaminotomy is mentioned already by probably it can be done uh, from uh, anterior by doing oblique porpectomy or uh, from posterior by doing uh, the drill the mini drill and the uh, at the uh, process and the compressing the roof um, this is for treatment of cervical radiculopathy with uh, minimal axial symptoms and it's happened then in a unilateral part and uh, the other choice was laminoplasty it's uh, will give comparable outcome complication when com compared with laminectomy and fusion it's a also motion preserving procedure but in the spine it's uh, if you going more to the motion so you will not get the perfect uh, fusion but if you focus yourself uh, your surgery in a perfect fusion you will, you will not get the perfect uh, motion preserving so you have to choose and some indication as some to me same indication as laminectomy and fusion laminoplasty is preferred in patient with minimal axial pain and no sign of instability like professor again said that we don't do again uh, lamino laminectomy without stabilization uh, especially uh, with a uh, patient with a uh, sign of instability uh, tend to instability and neck pain technique or with or without instrumentation we can do a french door or open door uh, i'm not expert on this but uh, some uh, make uh, many uh, instrument uh, some third party make many instrument to use at the uh, uh, laminoplasty laminectomy infusion with instrument same indication as laminoplasty and preferred for patient with significant neck pain so if uh, you need to do a very huge decompression, so you have no choice, then do the diffuse laminectomy. But you need to do a good of fusion and fixation uh, with it in this case. Uh, stabilization is recommended when performing laminectomy to prevent post-laminectomy kyphosis and the choice in cervical or lateral mesh to fixation and medical screw to C2, C7, and T1. So complication of surgery for anterior cervical surgery, it will be a pseudoarthrosis, graft dislodgement, resorption, or collapse, uh, dysphagia, hardness, vertebral injury, carotid injury, dural tears, esophageal injury, brachial injury, and nerve injury, C5, root palsy. All of these complications are already happened. Already happened to me when I was young spine surgeon. All the complications already happened, and you don't want that to happen again. The uh, complication for posterior cervical surgery was deficit neurological deficits. It's very common, especially uh, when you do laminectomy uh, to to lateral, and there's a uh, bleeding from massive bleeding from vein uh, and it will give uh, udema and uh, in fact due to uh, deficit of the the vascularization in and, and then will give uh, tetraparesis after surgery so it's the complication for actually in my opinion uh, i like 
anterior approach is much better than posterior because posterior is is just ruin all the structure and it, it, it will give more complication it will give more bleeding it will give more uh, risk for uh, paresis after surgery and if there's a severe axial neck pain uh, c5 nerve root palsy happen in the posterior cervical surgery and uh, post-operative management uh, some say that no rigid color is needed after instrument procedure but it depends on the surgeon uh, preference uh, yeah I, I think uh, we can it's 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 depend on the patient also the patient may be again range of motion exercise in the immediate post-operative period and it's depend also on the patient and soft collar may be used for uh, patient comfort and as a conclusion uh, spine degenerative disease is not as easy as it look and uh, if i may this is what i love from spine degenerative and what i hate at the same time because there are so many faults in this and the f surgery is not the first option it's different from the cervical tumor thank you i will uh, return to the chairman and uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Seflin, please. Thank you for the time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. For the first opportunity, I would like to give Dr. Ajit is unmute now. Is there any comment or question, Dr. Ajit, please? Okay, thank you. Very nice lecture, Dr. Uli. Dr. Uli is my teacher during my residency. So I would like to say thank you. That has taken me for a long time. Dr. Uli, for this session, I have a question. I agree with your uh, your note. This anterior, anterior approach is much better rather than posterior approach. For the case of lateria, lateral disherniation of cervical, which one you choose? Do you prefer to use posterior approach or anterior approach? Lateral disherniation, just one level. Yeah, if there's a lateral disherniation in cervical, for me, uh, I choose better uh, anterior approach and do uh, uh, the compression from anterior in it's it but it's it's for uh it's without uh, another uh, consideration about the key line and kyphotic and other but generally i will i would choose uh, anterior approach for uh, even the lateral because we can clean out the disc from anterior it's very wide open very wide space to reach even you can reach a uh, foramina part uh, from the anterior you can go laterally and even you can see the the tip of the 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 osteophyte and the this uh, the junction i mean the end plate you can see it from anterior clearly so uh, for me i choose uh, anterior dr ajit thank you is that uh, answer you yes Sorry. yes i i i see that so for the anterior usually we put a case there uh, in your opinion can we save only put a case alone or we just uh, we need a plate uh, to fix the 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 to uh, to prevent the listasis, do you use an uh, uh, anterior plate also, or only cakes? Yeah, uh, most most uh, it's it's depend it's depend on the patient itself. First is if it's only a uh, single level this and the uh, alignment was good, the lordotic was good, and uh, no osteophyte. Uh, and uh, the patient activity, the patient profession is not uh, an athlete somehow. And uh, there, there's some, some consideration. I prefer without a plate because uh, the when I, I don't know, but when, when we use a package, the package uh, we observe after surgery and uh, the slip, slip uh, of the cage is uh, very low. So I prefer without a uh, 
plate. But if uh, we do uh, two level of uh, discectomy and the uh, the alignment is not that good, uh, maybe maybe we can use uh, a plate, a uh, morpho plate or some plate uh, to uh, give a stronger construction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ajit. Thank you, Dr. Ruli, for the explanation. Uh, if I may continue Dr. Ajit's question, Dr. Ruli, if you don't put any uh, plate to the single level of herniation disc in the cervical, what is your best suggestion after the surgery to promote the strength of the fusion? Do you use the collar like Professor Zileli or? Yeah, I prefer use collar uh, to the, the patient, but uh, I, I, I don't know because uh, it's I'm not against collar, but uh, if we put the disc, if I mean, if we put the cage with a bone graft inside of it and we do a, a, a good distraction before insertion, the cage, uh, I think it's strong enough, even without uh, neck collar. It 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 will it will hold strong enough. Uh, in 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 uh, as a note that the patient have a good alignment, good lower So uh, I uh, I prefer uh, we can do without uh, uh, only for one level, yeah, one level expandable, uh, but I want a full package and a bone graph in it and good alignment. Uh, and uh, we do a good distraction when we insert the cage. Uh, I'm not used to uh, put a neck collar. At least maybe maybe two weeks after surgery, uh, we ask the patient to put a collar neck, and then the patient uh, control. And then if it's uh, the X-ray is quite good, uh, so I will ask the uh, I will not tell the patient to continue for the next two weeks for the uh, uh, neck collar. Thank you, Dr. Ruli. Um, Dr. Echo is yeah. on this, Dr. So, Echo. Thank you. Thank you, Zerlin, Dr. Zerlin. Uh, it is uh, very interesting that uh, Dr. Ruli, I heard Dr. Ruli used to, uh, to try to test whether the kids, big kids inside, uh, big kids when we put big kids, uh, in uh, intradiscal and after that we make testing like that i think this is uh, something very good because uh, we can save the plate we can save the plate like dr ruli said that uh, if there is uh, we will fill in doubt that uh, this is not strong enough the the kids so we may put the uh, plates I think this is a uh, very useful for the young surgeon for that. And uh, my question is, uh, truly, uh, what is uh, what do you think about uh, the kids from titanium, titanium, titanium kids? This is the first question, and the second question is. Uh, uh, do you use to put uh, mineralized bone matrix uh, beside the autograph? Thank you. Yeah, uh, about uh, thank you, Dr. Eko. About uh, the titanium, uh, uh, I, I use it uh, very rare, maybe it's a long time ago, uh, and uh, from from my 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 uh, op my opinion and my, my my I mean my personal experience and opinion uh, uh, titanium cage uh, compared to uh, peak cage is uh, peak cage is much better for promoting the, the fusion uh, and the uh, the alignment correction that done by the peak cage by or compared to titanium uh, in my opinion it's not that i'm not make uh, any uh, uh, journal so uh, it's not objective actually but 
I think uh, I choose prefer a uh, package more than a uh, titanium. And uh, in some some report I I have read I have read that uh, titanium uh, uh, the rate of uh, the jump jump rate is uh, a bit higher than uh, the package itself. And then uh, for the second uh, about the. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Bone matrix. Oh, yeah, bone matrix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Doctor Eko. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, to be honest, I have no experience about uh, bone matrix because uh, uh, first uh, I have no no read a lot about it, and second, uh, it's too expensive. So I, I always uh, we we always prefer choose uh, uh, iliac uh, bone graft. Uh, from uh, bone, from from the patient, uh, autograph. I mean, so uh, I don't have uh, any uh, experience about uh, matrix. Sorry, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Eko. For the mineralized bone matrix, if I may ask again, uh, do you use it uh, in your center? Uh, yeah, yeah, because. Uh, because when we take some graph from uh, our pelvis, it will create pain until 80%. So uh, there is some technique to to reduce the pain, of course, after we take the some part of the bone. So we close it and we uh, give some anesthetic agent there it can reduce uh, pain after operation, after we take the, the graph. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, this is more simple that we just put the uh, DBM inside, inside the case and uh, the fusion rate is uh, high. We never saw any uh, malunion after we put the, the DBM. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Doctor Eko, Doctor Sefli. So, uh, if uh, in in uh, I, I I mean uh, uh, in my personal uh, experience, uh, we can reduce the pain by make the cortical uh, cortical bone ectomy. I mean, taking the bone as small as possible. Uh, I I I I try to do uh, many techniques of uh, taking bone graft from ilia and patient is not complaining of uh, pain or very less of pain when we just taking the cortical bone around about uh, maximum one centimeter only so we don't take like uh, we don't take like a uh, three cortical bone graft because we are we, uh, we only need the content of the pelvic itself so we don't take uh, the uh three uh, I, I mean three cortical bone graph we just just uh, take uh, a little punch a little punch about half centimeter or maximum one centimeter and then put pure inside and take all the yeah. the the uh, cancerous bone inside taking like like we are eating an ice cream and then uh, close it with one single bone wax uh, and it's uh, really reduced the pain compared to uh, we are taking as uh, ma uh, 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 the hu the bigger uh, cortical bone, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah Thank you. Yeah. Yes, too. Thank you, Doctor Eko. Thank you, Doctor Ruli. Uh, do we have another question or comment? Doctor Ahmad Imron is unmuting now. Please, Doctor Imron. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just. Uh, comment not, not uh, question uh, i agree with uh, dr uh, ruli say that uh, the generative uh, cervical uh, spine uh, disease is uh, nice in mre picture but uh, bad for uh, a patient and sometimes uh, make a neurosurgeon scary uh, regarding the indication of uh, 
surgery uh, in my opinion is uh, there is a symptom symptomatic uh, we should uh, do surgery early uh, and how about uh, approach uh, in my opinion i think uh, approach depend on uh, where uh, pathologic uh, we find and uh, the problem is if uh, uh, like already uh, discussed before with uh, professor Girelli that uh, we should treat a patient not uh, MRE so uh, I, for uh, asymptomatic patient uh, uh, that is uh, uh, I still, I think, still, still uh, need more discussion. I think that is my my comment and my opinion, uh, Doctor Safi. Thank you uh, very much, Doctor Ruli, for your presentation. Thank you, Doctor Imran, my boss. Um. We have uh, one on from the attendee who is raising his hand, Dr. Fakar Hayat. I don't know. Uh, if you want to ask, you can ask directly. Unmute yourself, please. All right. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Very nice presentation, Dr. Ruling. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I learned a lot from because you presented right from the beginning from the basics, and then you progress nicely. Um, it's just a, a question just to improve ourselves, especially the youngsters, young consultants. I, I mean to say, what's the importance of positioning, especially in posterior decompression of CSM? And do you use uh, Donut, Mayfield, or what is the significance of uh, central inter-shoulder uh, shoulder roll? or by shoulder roll, horizontal or vertical, what do you pr uh, prefer? Uh, which, what is the standard? I mean, all we, we come across cases when the patient become uh, deteriorated in, this, in term of cardioparesis. So uh, uh, we need to uh, focus on that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fakhan. Uh, so uh, it's depend on the approach you want to do the anterior or posterior but if posterior uh, we prefer use uh, a donut yeah donut and and uh, the patient the neck the the shoulder the tip of the shoulder should be a bit higher than the c7 and c7 and c6 should be down lower and then it should be maintained at the uh, it should be maintained uh, in a direct uh, in a line and it's slightly uh, going higher until the the tip of the uh, occipital the tip of c1 is a bit higher than the c6 7 and uh, c5 6 and 7 so it will give a, a good uh, exposure and it will give a it will uh, maintain the venous return and uh, good and the, the the approach for us to work to do a uh, laminectomy or, or other procedure uh, will be uh, better that's that's my answer if maybe if it's answer you sorry yeah we usually use mayfield for posterior decompression three-point head fixation that gives us more stable and more safe stabilization for our procedure. That's our regular procedure. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, usually we use method only for uh, trauma, but, but, but thank you, that's a, a good uh, advice. Thank you, Dr. Farah. Thank you. Can I say something? Yes, please, Professor. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, this is a good uh, good point. Actually, we must be very careful on uh, on the position, especially in uh, very severe stenotic patients. 
uh, and we must avoid hyper extension of the head. Actually, uh, especially in the anterior surgery, the surgeon for its own comfort uh, try to make hyper extension, but uh, then uh, it causes more canal narrowing and it can harm the spinal cord. We must be in neutral position in, in anterior surgery. Posterior surgery, I always use Mayfield head clamp. Uh, and I don't think uh, other uh, fixation techniques will be good enough uh, and maybe dangerous. Uh, but anterior surgery, uh, you must be neutral. Thank you. Can Thank I you ask? for anticipating that. Sorry, can I ask? Please, Dr. Ajit. For the very high position like C1, C2 or, or very lower position like C6, C7, that we are very difficult to risk that. Is there any any trick for the position? Just for the normal or we can do the extension, hyper extension for the, for the uh, cervical? Yeah, for uh, giving a better exposure, better distraction, we can we use a uh, Mayfield and we do a retraction on the shoulder down by uh, some instrument or uh, stuff like uh, rope and plaster, and we put it down to 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 pull down the all the shoulder and the uh, scapula down. And then we can uh, do a bit retraction to uh, the cervical, uh, to the to the head, and retraction the cervical part. Is that an answer? Sorry. T two and three. Is there any advice for the position? Because sometimes it's so hard to reach the the, the, the level. C two three. Oh. C C. Is there any advice? C two three or T two three, C two C two three. Yeah, yes. yeah. It depends. Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, it's an anterior approach or posterior approach? Anterior approach for ACDF. Any oh, advice anterior for approach. Yeah. Position? Yes. Yeah. If anterior approach, uh, I, I I thought sorry, I thought it was a posterior approach that you asked. Uh, anterior approach, uh, it depends. Uh, if you are uh familiar with transoral surgery you can do transoral surgery it's it's it's, it's better for anterior approach to reach c1 and c2 but uh, i uh, in my opinion and uh, we do i prefer you use uh, sub sub, sub sub mandibular incision and uh, do more uh, hyper extension do more hyper extension of the patient but the head position is a bit uh, lower from the netra is a bit lower, do hyper extension a bit, and then you can do uh, exposure uh, with a submandibular uh, incision like this, and then like this, and then you can flap to the post, uh, infralaterally. Uh, that's uh, my suggestion. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruli. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Ajit and Dr. Ruli. We have uh, one question from the chat uh, column uh, because we uh, have some minutes left. From Dr. Musa, as you mentioned on the complications and experience, all sorts of the complications, any death, any history of plunging anteriorly and hitting the dura or cord very hard, resulting to tetra, ICU and response respiratory embarrassment. What are your tricks or experiences in avoiding plunging? Sorry, plunging? Uh, probably plunging is a kind of uh, graft uh, displace in, in, my, oh. in my perspective. Graft displace, if you put the graft, probably Dr. Rolin, this is my uh, my personal understanding about this question, Dr. Musa, if you can unmute yourself, you can unmute yourself. But plunging that he said here, probably if you put the graft or, uh, yeah, the graft, and then uh, you hit that so hard, so it is uh, displaced and hitting the dura. 
the mm -hmm. anterior part of the cord. Have this is for this is for anterior approach. Yes, anterior approach. Graph on the anterior approach. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. About the graph plunging to the to the posterior. I mean, you mean for graph yeah. plunging jump in the posterior and compression yeah, the cord? Probably, probably that was. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, uh, it's 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 never happened to me that complication. Uh, and uh, we can have a trick. Uh, uh, Dr. Musa by by uh, not not do the not do the uh, the corpectomy should not be uh, in a straight line to the posterior part but it should be like pyramid when you do the corpectomy from anterior and you make it like this a bit like this the graph will, will not uh, going down and push the cord so uh yeah, that's what that was. Uh, what I know that was my uh, our trick to put the to make the corpectomy is like a bit like a pyramid like this. So when we pull the when we push the graph and we do the hammer uh, power to do, to put the graph inside it and it will it will stop uh, by the pyramid in the bottom. So. Uh, my that's what my trick to prevent it but if it's happened yeah fortunately uh, we, we 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 never experience uh, it's paresis from that side but uh i ever experienced uh usophagus rupture due to uh dissection uh, dissection of the paravertebra uh, muscle and fascia too strong and then uh, i injured the osophagus that's what the the most uh Disaster happened in SEDF uh, for me. Is that uh, answer your question? How about uh, Dr. Uli, if I may continue his question, you talk about if we perform the carpectomy. How about if we only perform the disectomy? How we uh, avoid that when we put the interbody graph only in disectomy without any carpectomy? How we avoid those kind of complications? What is your trick? Yeah, yeah, my trick uh, is the same. So, uh, do the uh, even though when we try to do a disectomy and then we want to only do disectomy, but we need we still need to drill the end plate above and below. And when you, we drill it to give some uh, preparation to give more uh, vascular resistance or bleeding, I mean. Uh, don't don't do it uh, at the same way in the one line, but you can do the the uh, drilling of the end plate superior and lower uh, upper and lower uh, with a pyramid shape. That's what I mean. So you mean by the by we do the carpectomy, we use how we carpectomy as an anchor, as an anchor to the graft, so it will not jump. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uli. Yes, there's an input for, uh, from Dr. Ajit. Don't forget to use microscope so we can prevent injury with a good view, yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uli. Sorry, yeah. there's another uh, question from Dr. Musa. I just read uh, in case of oh, redo yeah. surgery, yeah, for adjacent yeah. diagnosis. Uh, do you go uh, the same side or uh, opposite? I will do the same side. Hello, yeah, yes, that's yeah. that's all. Yeah, yeah. In, in, yeah, I will do go at the same side, not the opposite. Okay, for a question from Dr. Fakar Hayat, how do you handle relatively large anterior dural tear? Yes, it was discussed before two times from Professor Zileli. He said he will stitch it directly and if stitch is not possible, he will put any uh, fascia into it and seal it with fibrin glue. Do you have any additional comment for this, Dr. Uli? And put I'm sorry, I'm, 
I'm sorry, the internet was down. Uh, can you repeat it? There is a question from Dr. Fakar. How do you handle relatively large anterior dural tear with carpectomy? He, he was not sure it, if this was discussed before. I said yes. This is uh, has been discussed with uh, Professor Zileli. The Professor Zileli said, if there is a dural tear, if you can stitch it, uh, stitch it, but if you cannot stitch it, Professor uh, usually put fascia and then seal it with the vibrant glue and put the patient in a lumbar drainage for about one week. Do you have any comment for that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I uh, I agree with that. Uh, in, in my opinion, if uh, the the leakage from anterior part of the cervical, especially uh, iatrogenic uh, rupture of dura or stuff like that, it's 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 quite uh, quite simple than rupture and leakage from posterior so if uh, we I, I don't i don't recommend to find the leakage and and uh, it will give more injury to the vein uh, because we know the vein pulling is anterior part and when we try to find the leak, leakage we will give more so much so much bleed so i prefer uh, put fascia and then put fibrin glue and just leave it and it will stop especially when the patient uh get up the cord will slightly move to the anterior and it it, it, it will give push to the uh, all i mean uh, to the posterior part of the body uh, of spine and it, it it will stop actually it will stop perfectly thank you dr Rui. um dr sabri is raising hand dr sabri do you have something to say dr sabri Yes, uh, wonderful uh, presentation, Dr. Ruli. Uh, the best for uh, decision making uh, and patient selection. Uh, for uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy, uh, do you recommend that uh, to order electrophysiology tests uh, like uh, electromyography or nerve conduction velocity? Or... Uh, uh, do you order uh, a dynamic MRI uh, for case uh, uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, I prefer uh, electrophysiology uh, monitoring uh, and uh, check the function because dynamic MRI is not, I, I don't know, but it's not uh, uh, give that much different compared to, to, to regular MRI. So, I, I, I think uh, monitoring and uh, electrophysiology is is uh, much better. If you give, uh, someone have opinion, another opinion, please. Is there any input from the panelists uh, for the electrophysiologic studies for the CSM? If I might uh, give a little opinion about this uh, nerve conduction studies, Dr. Ruli, if we perform this uh, nerve conduction studies or EMG in those CSM patients, yes, we have uh, some point to help us to diagnose. But I think the electrophysiologic studies is very operator dependent. So somehow if you perform it not in the good hand, uh, the result will be con confusing, I think, in my perspective. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, the C CSM itself is already uh, indication for surgery, right? Because no doubt about it, if if we have a patient with a sign in MRI stenosis, and we can see the symptom subjectively on patient as a I mean, uh, myelopathy and CSM, it's, 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 it's no doubt about it, we have to do uh, surgery. So, uh, electrophysiology will give uh, more information, but uh, I think, I think, I think uh, without the electrophysiology, EMG, uh, still we have to do uh, the surgery. But uh, the EMG, what you said, uh, the it for maybe it's more, more, more useful in uh, pain, in a pain condition. Uh, in multi-level disc degeneration like spondylosis and 
we have to find the focus of the pain, the 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 mo- the most severe of the radi- uh, radix. The uh, I, so maybe you can do that, but but in CSM, if we do with or without uh, the surgery, maybe we still have to do uh, surgery. Is it? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Professor Manajali, you do you um, want to say something? Dr. Oh. Tia, sorry. Please, Dr. Ajit. Yes, I I agree with Dr. Ruli. If usually in CSM we find paraparesis that one of indication of the surgery. So if we don't have any EMG, we can do a surgery with uh, this indication. But sometimes in patient that good uh, motoric power, usually in lower motoric power is good, we, we usually use intraoperative monitoring that's very useful for us to to see if there is something trouble with our surgery. So if we had intraoperative mo- monitoring, it's very, very useful to help us during uh, moni- complication, uh, mon- monitoring complication during our surgery. But EMG, usually in, in our hospital, we very seldom to use that in myelopathy patient. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ajit. Okay. Uh... Please, uh, I have a, a, another question. Yes. <laughs> uh, some author uh, report uh, uh, telling the fusion and fixation surgery can stop uh, progress of PLL. Uh, what do you recommend uh, management for mild OPLL, no the visit neurology, only my sensory symptom, Dr. Ruli? Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, mild sensory uh, symptom. It's mean without myelopathy. We without only pain. Myelopathy. Only pain. Only pain. Yeah. Uh, it depends. Uh, the patient uh, older or, or younger. Older, more than uh, uh, fifty-five year old. Oh yeah. Uh, how about the alignment? The key line is it uh, ten to forty or no? Key line it is good. Ah. Yeah, I prefer. Uh, uh, can can you prove it uh, with a CT scan? And there's stenosis, stenosis or no? Uh, stenosis, uh, mild stenosis. Canalis stenosis with OPLL. With mild foraminal stenosis also. Uh, not clear uh, foramen. Oh yeah, if that's so, uh, I I prefer do conservatively first. Wait and see. Do you mean that thoroughly? Yeah. Wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, because uh, uh there's some uh, I I ha- I have read about uh the progression of the OPLL itself. Uh, the the book said that OPLL is a physiologic mechanism, uh, and it's come because it's tried to compensate the imbalance, the chronic imbalance that happened in that patient. When patient have the chronic imbalance and uh, it will develop compensation, it's including the OPLL. So the problem is when OPLL causes the stenosis severe and make uh, paresis. So we help to we need to help the paresis. But if it's just uh, giving a mild pain, uh, in my opinion, I will just uh, wait and see and see where the process will end up. Here. If it's uh, become more severe and patient uh, cannot hold the pain anymore, fast more than seven, and there's developed myelopathy, so we don't have uh, another excuses to do the the compressive surgery because uh, OPLR, the compressive surgery from posterior is very very aggressive. I think, uh, like uh, Professor Gore said uh, in in Thailand, this was very inspired me. Uh, no bone can leave its place to decrease because all the bone taken as little as possible still create an instability. That's what Professor Gore said. Maybe Professor, if you hear, that was your lecture in Thailand. <laughs> 
thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we have to close. I'm sorry, we have to close this discussion session because uh, we are ten um, minutes delay. Um, yes, ten minutes delay. So. The next lecture will be from Professor Satish Chandra Gore about the transforaminal endoscopic for lumbar spine stenosis. Uh, Dr. Gore, you have, are you yeah, with us? Nice Please, uh, welcome, okay. Dr. Uh, Professor Satish Chandra Gore. Uh, yeah. Time use. you can share your screen. Okay, uh, am I audible probably? Yes. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, good afternoon to the panelists and my co-speakers. This is Dr. Satish Chandra Gore from Pune in India, which is very close to Bombay. And we are having monsoons and very heavy rains over here. So it's a different season altogether. Now I'm going to speak about application of transforaminal endoscopy in lumbar canal stenosis, which is a stitchless surgery under local anesthesia in an awake and aware patient. And I'm going to present it in two parts. Now the red link which I've written is a link to my books, which I've written recently. And these are the books just to show you. The one on the basic um, surgery for the disc and the second one is primarily on stenosis. Uh, on the right, you can see my system, which is marketed by Carl Storch for transforaminal endoscopic disc surgery. I'm in practice for the last 38 years, out of which I have done pure endoscopy only for the last 20 years. The transforaminal endoscopy started with Dr. Parvez Kambin and Dr. Sada Hisa Hijikata and Dr. Kambin started publishing his results in 1998 onwards. And the basic concept which he gave us was the safe triangle, which is a triangular space between the exiting nerve, the traversing nerve and the lower end plate at the disc level. And we have one more concept which was given to us by Dr. Stephen Kuslich from Philadelphia about pain generator. When we did multiple surgeries under local anesthesia, the routine traditional posterior midline surgeries. With, this, with these two concepts, we were very happy doing our transforaminal endoscopy for disc herniation all these years. In last six years, I have devoted a lot of time, energy, efforts for treatment of stenosis. In this picture, you see on the left, a cadaver dissection, where you see the nerve root going out around the pedicle, the nerve root going down here where my cursor is, and the nerve root then entering the root canal and going around the lower pedicle. The blue dot is the pedicle at L4, for example, and on the right, you will see the basic traditional concept that the area around the pedicle is a hidden area for a posterior midline surgery. And this green longish rectangle is an area which also is an area you can access only if you remove a lot of bone. Removal of the bone can make you get instability at the end of surgery. Now, if we talk about the canal, the lower part of this image on the right is showing the blue portion, which is the traditional central canal. The reddish portion is a subarticular zone or a lateral recess in the lower part. And this green is a foraminal and outside that the gray area is an extra foraminal area. Now we have to remember that in case of lumbar canal stenosis, there are three structures which can be affected. One is this root which is going around the pedicle and coming out of the foramen, which can be called as traversing root, entering the root canal and exiting in the foramen. The second is a root inside the thecal sac, in the lateral part of the thecal sac, where it is the traversing root intrathecal, which may be involved in the central canal 
under the bilateral posterolateral facet joints now i would like to tell you my learning out of 20 years of transforaminal endoscopy where i have done surgery under local anesthesia and surgery which has been stitchless etc what we have understood is there is a progressive change in the canal walls with respect to disc facet and ligamentum flavum plus additional age related changes in the system and the treatment does not change the natural history we are just trying to control the symptoms which come up which in case of disc are primarily pain and in case of stenosis are primarily numbness or deficit chronic cauda equina now we have also learned that there is back pain from the disc and there is a chronic posterior annular tear with trapped nuclear fragments which is a very very common cause of back pain in young people and in some people this heals it may not heal but it may heal and it may go on as healed unhealed etc and then the patient may land up with stenosis in the 60s we have found that there are six basic symptom groups and there are no infinite symptoms in degenerative lumbar spine these symptom groups to start with generally in 20s is knee pain heel pain groin pain and coccygeal pain in 30s it is discogenic back pain in 40s it is discogenic sciatic pain in 50s it is commonly facet related back pain and then of course you get claudication in 60s or above in a stable spine what i mean to say here is it may include the earlier symptoms which are lingering that is the patient may have back pain because of disc plus a claudication because of further narrowing of the canal and then of course we have claudication because of unstable spine now i am not going to talk about all these symptom groups except claudication because of stable spine and let me tell you that all this insight has come to me mainly because i operate my patient completely under local anesthesia the patient is able to talk with me when the surgery is going on now i would like to introduce to you these basic concepts there are three main causes for stenosis this is a over simplification but it is easier to understand that there are changes related to the disc anteriorly changes related to the facet posterior laterally and changes related to the ligamentum flavum posteriorly and posterior laterally now these changes may affect the thecal sac in the central canal and these changes may affect the nerve root in the root canal where it is entering or exiting now please mind you the causes in the anterior wall and lateral wall of the canal are already tackled very well by transforaminal entry where we come in the foramen and we can go in front of the dural sac towards the disc and we can work in the foramen where we have some soft tissue changes here we will now try to understand how we can go for the posterior wall now we have to remember one important concept all the causes which give rise to these problems are basically in proximity of the nerve roots and the nerve roots are locationally fixed especially the nerve root in the root canal the nerve roots inside the thecal sac are free and floating but there may be a compression of the thecal sac bilaterally posterolaterally giving rise to stenosis now we remember that when we come from behind posterior midline surgery and we are working between these two blue lines and this blue triangle we unnecessarily access we cut the bone in the midline we remove the ligamentum flavum which is completely irrelevant because this area does not cause any symptom there is no proof anywhere in any literature in the world which will tell you that this triangular area causes symptoms in fact there is a retro dural space of okuda this is the space now for the lateral races and exiting nerve path stenosis 
we need to cross these blue lines and go laterally and in that we may have to cut the facet edges indirectly adding to the instability now in transforaminal as you see the two arrows on the left we can come in as the arrow which is whitish and then tilt ourselves towards the roof of the canal by certain changes in our trajectory in short today for this surgery we are already working on the anterior wall and lateral wall of the canal and we would now like to show you how we work on the posterior wall now there is a new understanding of the ligamentum flavum and i am completely surprised to see that there are many many surgeons who are not even aware of what is called as lateral ligamentum flavum i will show within a minute and that the ligamentum flavum is not in parts it is a contiguous mass of tissue the importance is even when i go in the foramen i can access the ligament i can then pull on the ligament and follow it to the central canal now how do we address the stenosis by a traditional posterior midline approach or otherwise we go through the foramen and we access the ventral aspect of the posterior wall through the foraminal axis now this is a new understanding of the ligamentum flavum as you can see the ligamentum flavum is not horizontal interlaminar this image which you see is called as a 3d fusion image and it's a fusion of x ray ct mri together the yellowish green material is ligamentum flavum the orange is the nerve root and the greenish is the disc and on the right we have removed the bone which is white or black and we can see very well that at the upper portion of the ligamentum flavum is very very significant which apparently in our open surgery we may not be addressing so what we are doing is we are changing our surgery from the coronal plane to the sagittal plane and then we do not have any loss of bone and we divide this particular segment the lumbar spinal degenerative segment that is two vertebrae with the disc in between into three zones now as you can see on the left what i have marked about the zones is the upper zone is the one which is above the disc level so upper zone canal is the canal which is above the disc level from the lower border of the pedicle to the lower border of the vertebra the middle zone canal is the one which is behind the disc the lower zone canal is the root canal or the lateral recess and there are three parts of it part number 1 is the soft tissue lateral recess where you have soft tissue and the disc bulge from the lower end plate at the disc up to the upper border of the pedicle part number 2 is from upper border of pedicle to the middle part of the pedicle and part 3 is from middle part of pedicle to the lower border of the pedicle part 3 of the root canal is completely asymptomatic because there are no changes why because all the walls are bony now this is a picture of the same 3d fusion image where you can see very well and the important part is the disc and the facet and the ligamentum flavum do not lie in the same plane there is there is a huge problem with our imaging where we do a cross section or axial section where we only try and take a cut in the plane of the disc which is not correct we must also take a cut in the plane of the ligamentum flavum now here for example if you take a cut like this blue line the upper blue line then you find the ligamentum flavum in the v of the lamina and then that gives you a very very wrong impression the ligamentum flavum truly is here but of course the ligamentum flavum close to the nerve is in the upper foramen and may be in the lower foramen the ligamentum flavum is attached to the upper lamina on the ventral surface of the lamina and the lower attachment is to in two slips to the edge of the lamina lower now this is a coronal oblique image which shows you the ligamentum flavum and the blue arrow tells you the ligament above that is the lateral ligament which forms the roof of the foramen now 
I will quickly tell you about the targets in the lumbar canal stenosis and how do we go about it. The targets in the upper zone are mainly in respect to exiting nerve in the upper foramen. We call as target zero, that is just to remind you that there is no facet joint and there is no disc in the upper zone. Target one is the tissue in the axilla, the cover of the superior articular process, the tip of the superior articular process, the facet capsule with lateral ligamentum flavum. And this is the tissue which is commonly missed in open surgery which commonly gives failed back open surgery. This is one of the commonest causes of failed open surgery. The target two is a rare thing, which is pars defect. A defect in the pars, which may be naturally repaired by the body by fibrocartilage on the ventral surface of the pars, which may irritate the dorsal root ganglion. For this, we do a landing in the foramen closer to the upper end plate. Then in the middle zone, we have three targets. T3 is the ligamentous tissue on the medial face of the facet. T4 is the disc changes, mainly loss of posterior concavity of the disc, osteophytes, hardened, calcified, ossified annulus. T5 is the tissue in the foramen, which I call a G knot, which is an amalgamated tissue. And I will talk about it after a few minutes. And in association with back pain, commonly the cause of stenosis is anterior and these causes do not change with extension. As all of us know, in case of stenosis, the symptoms are always more with standing and walking. And when the symptoms are in the lateral part of the canal towards the root, they always increase with extension of the back. Now we assess the patient using a Japanese orthopedic association questionnaire there are 10 questions which are primarily about the distribution of numbness and after walking what happens to the numbness. One is a very mild form of stenosis claudication and number 10 is where the patient says that when I walk I, I find it very difficult to hold on to my bladder. I must pass urine otherwise I will wet my pants. Then you must remember that in the central canal or the middle zone, we have a chronic coda equina effect. We must understand that the detrusor can become underactive. And in all patients above 65, I always do ultrasound for post void residue of urine. And I can tell you in about 18% patients, we find that the bladder is already affected. Now, these are the people who land with bladder problems post-operative and they blame us. In middle zone, we land at mid-disc in sagittal and under ventral facet or around the SAP. You can quickly see this is a short animation of the middle zone where we are looking at the disc level and we are trying to see what all things are seen here. And you will find that the interlaminar window is not in line with the disc. It is below that. And then this is the way we see what it is. And here, let me tell you, in the middle zone, there are two bone portions. One from the, one, the inferior articular process from the bony vertebra above and then superior articular process from the body below. Now, in case of lower zone, that is the lateral resis, there is a target ventral to the disc. In part one of the lateral resis, there is the target dorsal to the disc in part two. And there could be synovial cyst, which can also give rise to symptoms. And for that, we generally land in the lower notch. And we'll quickly see this, what it is. This is a part one, which is above this notch, lower notch. And this is the way it would be. The facet joint is much away in this part and then if we go for the second one, we will find that the facet joint is much away but there could be changes here which can give rise to stenosis in the second part. Now summary of the concepts is surgery is under local anesthesia even in comorbid patients. I have operated a patient aged 92 under local anesthesia. It is stitchless, important it can be staged. You can do the surgery in multiple stages 
it is not necessary that you must finish everything in one go the patient is awake and aware and in extremes of age it is very very important to have the patient awake and aware i already delineated the three zones three walls three causes that is disc facet and ligament and i already told you there are nine targets in stenosis now let me clarify certain concepts this is a basic concept the upper zone above the disc this is the canal behind the body middle zone behind the disc between the facets lower zone inside the pedicle or little above the pedicle to up to mid pedicle this is what we look at from the ventral aspect this blue thing on the right is the central canal which is lined by both facet joints posterior laterally please mind you that the posterior midline is far away it does not cause any symptom in central canal it's a complete irrelevant point which has been hammered in our heads for no reason and i will clarify a little more further this is the nerve which is going below the pedicle this is the traversing nerve which will come down and then enter the root canal and go around the pedicle now we have seen that the ligamentum flavum is not only the yellow one but the maroon one which goes from the midline towards the upper pedicle and the ligament which is outside the medial pedicle line is the lateral ligamentum flavum the one which i am pointing out now and this is what forms the roof of the upper foramen this is what gives stenosis of the foramen or the upper zone so just to show again this is the ligamentum flavum close to the root in the upper zone the disc and the ligament both may cause problem in the middle zone and the root which is going through the root canal may have a little bit due to the ligamentum flavum but primarily because of facet now this is a very important figure which is a ventral dissection of the ligamentum flavum and i can tell you that this is a much neglected topic and most of the surgeons are completely ignorant about how the ligamentum flavum is now this is not a artificial model this is a cadaver the only thing what we have done is we have colored it brown so that it can be seen very well now if you draw a line like this where i am pointing which is a medial pedicle line you will find there is a large portion of ligamentum flavum outside the line secondly the number 1 which is written here is posterior midline which is not close to any neural tissue the main tissue which is causing symptoms is the one in the upper part of this red circle the second point in the lower part of the circle is if you look at the medial aspect of the pedicle this is a root canal and generally let me tell you the ligamentum flavum is absent in the lower zone now unfortunately all of us have been told to do a mandatory medial facetectomy and remove the medial facet here and come inside so we need to have a better understanding of this anatomy otherwise sometimes our surgery may not be relevant now our open surgery is like this we remove the spinous process we remove the lamina then we go up to the pars we keep the pars because otherwise it will destabilize then we go for the decompression of the exiting nerve then we go for the traversing nerve and then we de decompress below the pedicle by whatever way by going far lateral here maybe remove the medial facet then we complete the lateral recess decompression then we have already removed the ligamentum flavum here and then we make sure that there is no disc herniation the problem here is you are in the posterior midline and disc cutting is completely irrelevant and what you are trying to do is you are trying to cover these three zones of the ligamentum flavum by extending your reach by laminotomy whereas i can go selectively for those three areas through the foramen i have no quarrel with people who do this surgery but i am just trying to point out that our surgery is much finer now this is a very important paper and one of the only papers which is about morphological changes of ligamentum flavum uh, as a cause of nerve root compression now this is a old paper 1997 by usman and punjabi 
where a comparison of posterior midline axis and transforaminal decompression for stenosis has been done and transforaminal decompression has been found to be about 25% better now we have to remember that this is a cadaver study but we are doing a similar live surgery every day now this again it just to emphasize that on the left we are looking at the lumbar segment which is affected with degeneration quickly the u is upper part of the canal above this end plate and the sap m is the middle part of the canal l is the lower zone part 1 above this that is the lower notch part 2 up to mid pedicle part 3 below that this again will completely clarify t1 t2 is here the targets 1 and 2 target 3 is on the medial face here 4 is the posterior aspect of the disc 5 is in the foramen 6 is ventral to the nerve entering the root canal 7 and 8 are dorsal and synovial cyst now what we have to discuss also is about the timing of the surgery and i in general for stenosis follow the bladder function if the bladder function is terribly affected and there is a post void residue more than 100 ml i would prefer to operate the patient as early as possible otherwise you can always try multiple things including gabapentin pregabalin steroids physical therapy whatever you can also try epidural steroids then what we do is we also decide the timing of surgery in respect to activities of daily life and what predicts the success or residual symptoms is if the patient has a numbness which is all the time present not only with activity it is very unlikely to recover after surgery because the nerves are probably permanently changed and in outcomes we try to go for quality of life considerations and about walking related time and steps and this is mainly about root related symptoms about cauda equina related symptoms that is bladder bowel etc we need to go in for activities of daily life and then look for the changes now i'm going to quickly show you the upper zone surgery the blue line above that is the upper zone n is the nerve on the left you can see l4 body the l5 body the disc in between and we are going to operate in this area and our primary target is the roof of the upper zone that is the tissue which is behind the nerve now this is quickly a mri classification of the foraminal stenosis but we can definitely learn from this that the tissue from behind is ligamentum flavum plus scapular tissue and we can definitely remove this which is there now there is one point here the patient may have a collapsed disc and we may have to put in a expandable cage which nowadays is available to be put through our cannula under local anesthesia we don't have to do another surgery and i normally will not do a posterior fixation unless the tension band posteriorly is disturbed now there is a small animation which will tell you about the upper zone what we are going to do is to build the upper zone that is we will be going up from below and we will try to look at the tissues please mind you you can see that the nerves are more lateral here as they are trying to come out and now we will be building this upper zone by adding layers here and this is the upper zone that is this is the roof of the upper zone the paracentral articularis now you can see here where is the ligamentum flavum where is the nerve etc etc and you will find that the main thing which we have to do as we go on building up is related to the roof here in the upper part of the foramen okay now this is a very short clip of we are about looking at the intervertebral foramen and as you can see this is where the superior articular process of the inferior vertebra is situated now if we look deeper in the foramen we will find this is the inferior articular process of the superior vertebra and there are two essential causes which come in the way of the functioning of the nerve in the case of stenosis what happens is we have a growth of yeah you can see here there is osteophytic growth here commonly and there could be hypertrophic tissue on the tip of the sap which can give rise to the changes yeah, of stenosis now the target here is this blue circle 
and the yellow blue circle is the tip of the sap the yellow is the soft tissue the red is a danger the segmental artery which goes to the foramen close to the foramen here which is a branch of the aorta is lying here so you're not supposed to go in this area or you may land up in trouble and when you have a collapsed disc our target would be more related to the tip of the sap that is here you can see we are looking at the left side foramen and this white this black line is what decide this is the portion which we may remove now i'm quickly showing you my surgical slides we are doing surgery on the left side the patient is prone 12 o'clock of the picture is dorsal 6 is ventral the red arrow is the tip of the sap and on the left would be the axilla now we take a curette and we start cutting the sap the sap is cut here you can see the sap is reduced in size now the ligamentum flavum comes in view the 6 o'clock area is the epidural tissue plane we go further go on cutting this tissue we remove the sap as you can see the shiny epidural fat and the epidural tissue here and then we may do a little bit of hemostasis using a bipolar rf our surgery is endoscopic under local under irrigation now we can see further we have removed this tissue which is lying in the axilla you can slowly start seeing the tissue in the epidural space this is the iap the inferior articular process since we are working against the bone there is no harm in scraping this area in addition when you want to go for the middle zone we can go around the sap following the ligamentum flavor now we use a slow a uh, 525 rpm burr we do not need a high speed drill 60000 100000 is not needed this is a hook which i use through my scope to understand the texture of the tissue and the various tissue planes now quickly i'll go to the middle zone we have this classification by shizaz in mri but let me concentrate or highlight two points you can see a pincer here which i am pointing with this red Uh, arms that is what it is and the compression is at the tip of the pincers not at the back or the apex of the pincer and then please remember this classification is showing certain changes but these images are not from the same patient this is not progression of the same patient this is a collection of multiple images and classification the roots are normally free floating but commonly we do a mri in supine so the roots are sort of sedimenting this is normal the first picture a1 and in case of b you will find the roots are crowded because the canal has become smaller and d it will be completely obliterated because the csf will not be seen now this is again to tell you that in the middle zone we are working behind the disc on the medial face of the facet which you are seeing of the opposite side and we also work in the upper part if necessary and around this we can also work on the disc if it has lost its posterior concavity this is summary image anteriorly you can have a disc bulge and posteriorly you can have this hypertrophic tissue mind you the posterior midline is far away it does not cause any symptoms whatsoever i have found no evidence anywhere where you have evidence to say that posterior midline tissue causes a problem now this is again building up the mid zone i'll just quickly show you so what we do is we go on adding the layers up and you will find that the ligamentum flavum will be coming here posterolaterally and little medially but not the posterior midline mind you that is a point which i am trying to convey to you that posterior midline structures have no relation to the symptom causing areas unless the canal is congenitally narrow or the pedicles are short or there is a severe stenosis now the symptoms may start on one side and then may progress on the other side now here you can see we have built up the middle zone and we have seen all the tissues coming up now so what we do is we here have a case where you have a calcified disc as you can see in the x ray and ct on the left on the right you see the osteophyte through the scope i'm using the drill or a curette to remove that osteophyte now this is a surgery which i have done on the right side so the superior articular process is seen here the axilla is on the right 
I'm looking towards the epidural space here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to work on this SAP right up to the lower notch on the left and undercut the ventral facet and decompress the roots here. So I'm going one by one. I'm turning my cannula towards the lower zone. I'm now seeing some epidural tissue. I see the lower zone. Then I drill this undersurface of the ventral facet. On the right is the axilla. Then I can see the epidural tissue. I can see the dural sac. I can see the ligamentum flavum. I start removing this tissue. I start going slowly towards the lower zone. I'm using a bipolar to have hemostasis. This is the lower zone on the left below the facet here. This is a complete decompression. We will further go for this tissue and we'll see that it's a pulsating tissue there. This is a burr, slow speed as I told you. This is what we have done. This is the way we decompress the central canal. We can do this surgery bilaterally. This is the way we work and we confirm that we are not crossing the uh, medial pedicle line in general because the dural sac is very close there. Now, this is a G-naught as I call it. This is the amalgamation of tissue which is covering the SAP, the ligamentum flavum, facet capsule, the annulus, the osteophyte here and hypertrophic tissue in between. All these can come together and push the nerve towards the upper pedicle or the vertebral body and can give rise to symptoms more of foraminal stenosis or upper zone stenosis. Now this is about the lower zone where you may have changes ventral to the nerve when it is entering this canal or dorsal to the nerve related to the facet joint. Now I will not uh, probably spend time in this building up. I'll straight away go here. Now remember we are doing a surgery on the left side. This is the lower zone. This is the superior articular process. This is the epidural tissue which I am showing. This is a disc entry, 12 o'clock is dorsal, 6 is ventral, and then we will slowly start. Now, this is a little longer video, 4 minutes or so. Please have a look. This is courtesy, my friend. And we are now looking at use of a hook and a curet on the roof of the canal. Now, this instrument is stuck now on the upper part of the lamina. As you can see in the x-ray here, it is very well seen here. You can see the tip of the instrument on the upper part of the lamina there. So what we are doing is we are trying to mobilize the ligamentum flavum there. And we should soon be able to remove that as you can see further. So we are in the foramen. The patient is completely awake. The surgery is under local and with irrigation. And we are dorsal to the dural sac. And right side is towards the leg, 12 o'clock up is dorsal, 6 o'clock is ventral. And you can see the pulsatile tissue, which is the epidural tissue. Now what we'll do is we'll further go towards the right, that is the lower zone, and try to mobilize the ligamentum flavor. Now, what will happen is you may not believe that we have removed it, but I'll show you the pre and post-op images, which will clarify. Just give me a minute or two, and we should be able to complete this. I don't have many more slides after this. I will stick to the time. So here we are working on that tissue. Now we will sort of scrape it out from the lamina. One important anatomical image is see here. We are now close to the pedicle. We are in the roof of the lateral canal. You can see here. Important anatomical point is there are hardly any veins dorsal to the dural sac in the lumbar spine. There are veins lateral and ventral which come out of the foramen and join the ascending lumbar vein. So we are safe here. Then we go ahead. I am just trying to... Now you can see again my instrument here. I hope you saw that which is bending now. I am feeling the medial wall of the pedicle. I can mobilize the nerve very well. Patient is completely awake. So there is no harm in working here. We actually say this is a natural... Uh, neuro monitoring because the patient is awake. Now we will go further and you can see here we have completely removed the tissue and then we will go for the images. Now this is a post-op image. Okay, I'll, I'll clarify what I'm showing. This was at 4-5 here and we have removed the ligamentum flavum here. You will be able to see it better in the axial image.
and this is a pre-op image where you can see a disc and uh, this is again a post-op image you can see this is a, this tissue has been now you can see here on the left side under the lamina and the facet the ligamentum flavum has been completely removed on this side i hope this is a very very clear and this decompresses the sac very well and also the root while it is entering the root canal now this is a part of the post op image this is a part of the pre op image you can see this ligamentum flavum like a v and we have removed the tip of this v which completes our decompression there now we continue further we can go ventral to the nerve you can see this nerve here towards the lower zone this is my work inside the disc you can see the nerve towards the right of the image here and the nerve is completely decompressed ventrally as well as dorsally now last few slides this is a strategy for stenosis the big white arrow is undercut the ventral facet go in remove the ligamentum flavum etc this curved arrow is go above the superior articular process and work in the upper zone and middle zone and this thick white arrow is for going to the lower zone now this is to show you the three zones there are three walls which can tackle anterior lateral posterior three causes we can tackle disc facet and ligamentum flavum and we can have images in three planes sagittal coronal and axial and we do a lateral decompression now this is a summary image upper zone middle zone lower zone how we go through the foramen how we land here etc and our results have been about 70% of our patients have been happy when the claudication was more related to the root the percentage of patients happy is very high about 83 recurrence of symptoms or residual symptoms are possible in about 15% complications which are commonly seen as dural tear nerve injuries vascular injuries are zero and the patient may be able to go home within 24 hours time and what we have learned is the morbidity of surgery can be removed can be reduced we can operate comorbid patients we can stage the surgery in multiple steps there is a unnecessary peer pressure and industry dominance about stabilization i personally feel it is unnecessary now this is the link to my catalog for the books i hope i have clarified my concepts thank you very much thank you very much dr gore it was very excellent presentation so we will move to the discussion session we have the first question from the panelists uh, from the chat column from dr sabri he asked some surgeon i seen after removal of free fragment disc per endoscopic they place epidural catheter at the same site and give some steroid and local anesthesia do you recommend that way i do not recommend epidural anesthesia because it is dangerous you are working in a very tight space let me clarify our cannula working cannula is about 7.6 mm the lower notch of the foramen that is here the lower part of the foramen i don't know okay the lower part of the foramen here is around 8 or less millimeters so there is a very less space especially in the lower zone and you may break your instruments that is number 1 you may injure the nerve if your vision is not very clear if you have a lot of oozing in that area unless you have a good bipolar cautery you will not be able to do proper job and then keeping the patient under anesthesia or epidural anesthesia is extremely dangerous i do not advise anesthesia except local just at the target thank you dr gore we have dr ajit is unmuting yes. now please dr ajit <clears throat> thank you very nice presentation dr gore very wonderful presentation i'm interested with your metric gore metric to pointing the pain cause of the spine in case of multiple disc herniation and we have radiculopathy what is your advice to find the cause of the pain on the lumbar and what will you do to surgery yes yeah in case of multiple you must be aware that lumbar canal stenosis is very very commonly seen at l3 4 and l4 5 l5 s1 is not very common unless you are dealing with a foraminal stenosis okay central canal stenosis at 51 is not common and what we can do is there is a mri protocol called as um what is that 
called as uh, let me remember I, i just slipped out of my mind where you can actually see the vascular insufficiency in relation to the root okay so you can ask the mri people to tell you which root is affected now if we are talking about multiple level affection in the central canal theoretically transforaminal surgery still can be done by targeting the maximally affected level first bilaterally at the same time and then taking up the second level that is the level above or level below commonest which i have done is l4 5 i may do l3 4 at the second stage as i said since my surgery is under local i have no problems i can do it second time and i can explain to the patient that it is mainly for safety that we are doing like that it is called a diffusion tensor so imaging so dti express. now if you do dti in mri you can get a clear DTI, picture yeah. which root is affected did that answer your question yes can we can we do if if uh, we are still difficult to find the, the the cause of the pain can we do like the radio frequency for radicular or radicular injection with lidocaine to pointing the cause of the pain no uh, sorry please say it again i didn't get you properly please say it again if if there are still difficult to find the cause of the pain can we do radio frequency like uh post radio frequency on the level that we suspect the pain or using lidocaine injection in the in the radicular nerve okay uh, now let me clarify that we are not doing disc surgery primarily which commonly presents as pain all the pain blocks which are given around the root around the dorsal root ganglion intradiscal transfacet etc are primarily on the basis that there is inflammation around the root or around that particular structure in case of stenosis it is something which is going on for years together it is not something which goes on for one week or 10 days or something so giving these blocks is not of much help in place of that i can suggest you that you can put a needle and do a epidurogram epidurogram that is you put a needle in the axilla and inject radio opaque dye now the radio opaque dye should spread very easily anterior to the dura and depending on the position of the needle posterior to the dura and then you can judge which it's like doing a myelography for example okay so you can get to know which structure is compressing that area when you have radicular pain you have claudication which is painful where the patient says pain going down the leg but i am unable to stand and walk etc then you can give a block you can inject steroid you can inject um, i mean platelet rich uh, fibrin etc and you can even uh, inject ozone but these measures are temporary they will only tell you whether you are able to reduce that pain now please remember if you are able to reduce the pain it doesn't mean that your decompressive surgery will also result in the same thing there is a mismatch in the patient's narration to you after your block and the actual outcome of the surgery so do not match it i mean don't guarantee the patient that now that you have relief with the injection my surgery will also relieve you because our compression in stenosis is related to venous congestion i am sure you are aware of that there is a valveless batson's plexus which has a relation to the intestinal system and primary problem is not ischemia it is congestion of the venous system you must be aware that there are a lot of people who say that when they empty their bowel in the morning their symptoms are much better why because the venous pressure is reduced this venous pressure cannot be reduced by a block okay the block will only reduce the pressure which is because of prostaglandins interleukins or tnf alpha which is a common cytokines in inflammation in relation to the disc so roll up blocks no or if you give a block for radicular don't guarantee the same result and instead of block do a epidurogram or ask the mri fellow to give you a dti 
diffusion tensor imaging which will completely tell you how one root out of multiple is affected thank you professor very nice thank you so much professor yeah. uh, continuing to your explanation i will read one of the question here from our resident he asked about your procedure He asked about what average time you usually do this endoscopic procedure and what local anesthesia agent you prefer to use and how you give this local anesthesia to your procedure. Okay, uh, I would need to give you a detailed answer. I do have an anesthetist present for all my procedures to look at the vital signs of the patient. What I do is I first of all counsel the patient very well and explain that our surgery even though it's a surgery it's not going to put you into more pain our surgery is to reduce your suffering so after counseling our anesthetist also counsels the patient and we use iv tramadol or fentanyl or midazolam prior or during our surgery and intervention but as you know in case of stenosis the tissue which you treat tissue which you touch is not very painful i mean the ventral facet is not painful the upper part of the ligamentum flavum is not painful the only pain is when you are working in the lower zone close to the nerve and maneuvering the nerve but you will find that when you complete the surgery at the end of surgery the nerve becomes painless the anesthesia which we use is 1% or 2% plain lignocaine without adrenaline and this is injected after i put my needle in the foramen it is not given before it is given only after the needle is properly put in the foramen close to the annulus or the facet the anesthetist is monitoring the patient and when i try to enter there with my uh, dilator that is what i tap inside i tell the anesthetist that i am going to tap so they normally cover that 1 minute or half a minute by midazolam or fentanyl or tramadol and that is enough the patient is completely comfortable in fact you can ask the patient to raise the shoulders you can ask the patient to cough during the surgery to see the impulse of the neural tissue in relation to the bony tissue thank you professor so in average time uh, how long do you do you uh, perform this procedure in your average case how long yes how many how many minutes how many hour from okay. skin to if you are talking about this surgery it will not take more than 30 minutes 30 if you are doing lumbar canal stenosis bilaterally or unilaterally the unilateral will take about 50 minutes to 70 minutes if you are doing both level both sides at the same level it may take about 90 minutes now this time will vary from person to person but i can tell you that if you build a very good team where you have an anesthetist who understands what you're going to do you have a good assistant nurse who can give proper instrument you see there is one important point the point is when i am operating i'm looking at a screen i'm looking at the video display my scope is inside the patient the patient is prone and my hands are working but my eyes are looking at the screen my ears are open to the anesthetist giving me inputs i occasionally look at the cardiac monitor and if your assistant or the nurse is all the time not giving you proper instruments and you have to take your eyes off the screen and look at the nurse and say okay give me then you lose your concentration this is a extremely precise surgery you have to remember that i can tell you that a cambin strangle is 12 mm in height 18 mm at base and 23 mm at the hypotenuse in a patient who is 6 foot 2 inches tall now we asians are shorter people so our cambin strangle is still shorter it is about 10 mm by 16 by 18 mm so you are in a very very tiny area you have to be very precise and therefore keeping the patient at the local helps you and the duration of surgery would reduce once you start doing it routinely your assistant your whole team understands you well 
and your plan of action has to be ready before you start the surgery this is not a surgery by trial and error this is not a surgery where you take the decision after you open no if you ask me i can tell you all the steps of my surgery even before i put my scope okay because all that plan is clear in my mind where i am going to go where i am going to look now this may sound very difficult but it's not it is very simple why because our focus area is very small it's not something which is kilometers it is probably around 16 mm from pedicle to pedicle or maybe more 20 mm thank you professor and we have our panelist dr muhammad saiku is raising hand uh please yeah, thank you saiku uh, thank you very much thank you very much professor uh, very clear and impressive uh, presentation uh, i would like to know do you think transforaminal endoscopy is possible for lumbar carpal stenosis decompression patient with caudo equina syndrome yes absolutely. absolutely 100% no doubts about it why because i am not doing a laminectomy i am not removing everything which is lying behind the dural stack i am taking care of the anterior causes i am taking care of the causes in the foramen my patient is awake so patient can tell me when i am maneuvering the tissue and i have much much finer understanding of the mri i do not have a block understanding where you remove everything that is absolutely dumb way of treating lumbar canal stenosis i have a very very harsh feeling about it i feel that all of us are surgeons who are trained who are intelligent people why are we following some guidelines which have been given 50 years back which have been given when that hidden zone of macnab was a glamorous thing to know why why should we do that i mean what i'm saying is we are much finer about analyzing the problem and understanding our targets so i can tell you i can definitely treat the patient by transforaminal endoscopic surgery uh the second question is uh do you perform in unilateral approach or bilaterally for such cases no i normally find that for example a patient comes to me and says that i am having pain or numbness on standing or walking in my left leg for last say 2 years then i ask him what about the other side the patient says yeah a little bit but you know that is only for last one month or maybe two months you must have seen that most of the patients will come to you when the symptoms become bilateral commonly they may not come when the symptoms are unilateral i mean unless they, it is very severe commonly they will wait for the other side number 2 is if the patient then tells me or i find on ultrasound examination that the bladder is also involved then i tell the patient that surgery is essential urgent and i would do a bilateral surgery now i tell the patient that since you are suffering on one side for 2 years i will do that side first now as all of us know that when you do surgery in the cervical spine the dural sac shifts the same thing happens in lumbar spine when you operate on one side for example and do a good decompression with ventral facet cutting etc removal of the ligamentum flavum the dural sac shifts so if the other side symptoms are for a short duration you may not need surgery on the other side at that time i am open to the surgery on the other side over a period of time i have clarified that i am not altering the natural history of the disease i am only taking care of the symptoms at that time the patient can always have a recurrence of symptoms the patient can come back after a couple of years and say that i have the same problem but on the other side what i am trying to tell you i'll just ask you a question in lighter vein who are the smartest surgeons i think the smartest surgeons are dental surgeons okay why because they do a tiny job in 10 sittings and that is all accepted by everyone why is it that spine surgery must be finished in one go <laughs> why i don't understand that you can always stage it i mean if the patient agrees the only objection which i have seen is the patient say 
if you're not going to charge me again i am ready so probably it comes to question of money rather than second stage surgery uh thank you professor the last question is uh do you just remove the fluff whom just around the uh enough or uh, also fluff whom in the medial side or just around the foramen i did not get your question properly i heard like uh do i work around the nerve only or do i go to the dural sac is it yeah okay as you know when i land in that triangle the medial side that is towards the midline is the dural sac which is hidden by the facet when i cut the facet the ventral surface of the facet which is the extra articular surface of the facet i see the dural sac very well then if i turn my cannula towards the head my turn my scope towards the head i can see the nerve exiting nerve the dorsal root ganglion i can tell you one more thing you see for want of time i couldn't show all that i also see the dorsal ramus coming out of the dorsal root ganglion okay it comes up like this the dorsal root ganglion looks like a bulb of onion where the thing is coming up the the dorsal root comes up and then goes through the intertransverse ligament and then supplies the facet joint so i can take care of the facet pain also in the same transforaminal surgery as i said what we have to do is in fact i'm going to request you people to have a good cadaver course so that people understand this finer anatomy otherwise it's too gross to sort of describe and most of the people may not believe this so i work in the axilla i do not have to work outside the foramen unless i am dealing with a extra foraminal cause or osteophyte i work under the facet i go anterior to the dura i go posterior to the dura so this is important i can go anterior lateral and posterior to the dura under local through the same thing and i work around now the the traversing nerve is intrathecal in some cases the traversing nerve leaves the dural sac early so in the lower zone towards the lower part of the foramen you can see the nerve separate from the dural sac now i'm sure all of us who do a medial facetectomy have realized that going lateral to that nerve and going medial to that nerve creates a lot of issues i mean it's not a simple job whereas for me it's very simple in some cases when there is a problem lateral to the nerve i can also do a oblique pediculectomy i mean i cut the pedicle from above towards the medial uh, towards the midline the upper quadrant of the pedicle this is the circle let's say we are looking at a clock face i cut from 12 to 3 on that side so i can decompress the nerve that way also and this is under vision i am seeing the nerve all the time there is one more thing which i forgot to mention in that area when i work around the nerve and i have completely decompressed the nerve the veins fill up okay you are looking at a nerve which is very pale and white at the end of the surgery the veins will fill up and if you touch the nerve at the start of surgery nerve is very painful patient says ah oh, even if he is under local anesthesia there but at the end of surgery you put a hook and pull it etc patient is completely comfortable that painful part of the nerve becomes painless so that is what we have learned thank you very much professor yeah. gorais very uh, clear uh, lecture thank you thank you So, Professor Gore, based on your experience in this transforaminal endoscopy for the herniated disc, how about your recurrence rate? Um, okay, I already explained to you that in case of stenosis, what we are talking about is claudication for, let's say, patient unable to stand beyond ten minutes, patient unable to walk beyond hundred meters. patient having bladder problems etc now i can tell you that recurrence is not a correct word for stenosis i mean i would say recurrence of symptom should be separated from recurrence of pathology okay there are two things recurrence of symptoms will not be recurrence of symptoms in short term after the surgery there will be residual symptoms 
the patient will say that before surgery i could stand for 10 minutes now i can stand for 45 minutes i can stand for 1 hour etc i used to walk 100 steps now i can walk for 1000 steps like that the patient may still have some symptoms we are not able to say like this herniation that your symptoms will go completely that confidence is not there because there is nothing to be measured there is nothing to be quantified the images the symptoms they do match for the location not for the severity now as i said recurrence of pathology you must tell the patient that once i have removed your right sided ligamentum flavum it is not going to come back it has gone the left sided which is remaining may hypertrophy further etc then the patient would say why not remove that at the same time absolutely no problem we can do that a practical problem i'll tell you if you do bilateral surgery and the patient has to lie prone for about 90 minutes the problem is not with the lumbar spine they start getting pain in the neck and then they start doing like this and they say oh my neck is so stiff and the other problem sometimes is when we do irrigation if the irrigation is used by a pump it may increase the epidural pressure and add to that neck pain so neck pain in a patient who is prone is a bad sign you should remember this patient saying oh i have pain in the neck either you have exceeded the time or the epidural pressure is very high thank you professor very clear explanations and i will uh, if uh, the panelists uh, have any comment or question uh, you can directly unmute yourself while i will read uh, one question from the chat column dr musa was asking about in cutting the superior articular process apart from the curet and partial drills what is the role of manual cylindrical drills Uh, what is the last word you said manual manual cylindrical drills yeah what is okay. you see there are various ways of cutting that bone but please remember it's not like femur or it's not like a cortical bone it's a very thin bone in osteoporotic patient in fact even with the hook you can sort of cut it curet is enough a hand drill with 525 rpm is enough you don't need a high speed drill uh, because it is expensive I can tell you that the cost of the high speed drill alone is equivalent to set of instruments which I have. That is too too expensive. And you can always use tree finds. There are instruments which are available from some other company which go through the cannula and you can ream the facet. You can ream the ventral part of the facet under local under vision. I mean under C arm guidance. So you don't need a high speed high speed drill. You can use reamers. You can use curettes. you can use um, laser in some instance i used to use laser in the past but it's very expensive i mean you can't afford a 100000 dollars is the minimum price nowadays it has come down to about 60000 but it's still very expensive thank you professor and if the panelists uh, have no question and comment oh dr uh, echo and you yeah. now dr echo Yeah, thank you, Professor, for an excellent uh, lecture. So I want to uh, know what is your concept of uh, stability in this regard. Uh, I mean, when you think after uh, decompression from foramina, uh, this patient need for uh, fusion. Okay, um, yes. I would tell you the first indication for fusion. is when the patient will have a rapid collapse of the surgery which is anterior to the dura commonly the disc related surgery the patient gets a collapse after the surgery very rapidly within 6 months or a year in which case you have to jack up the disc or you have a patient who has a mild instability that is you see a wet facet on a mri and you will find if you do a flexion extension x ray there may be little immobil a uh, little mobility Four to six mm, less than six mm. In that case, you can offer a trans facet fusion under local by putting a cancellous screw through the facet, not trans pedicular. I'm saying trans facet, which is adequate. The third thing is when the patient has instability and claudication, it is definitely a case for fusion stabilization. In that case, what we do is something I'll describe in about one minute. 
we do what we call as hybrid surgery we start the surgery on the local do the transforaminal decompression then we give epidural through the foramen then we go for a small open t lift from that side i mean removing the facet etc there are three four advantages my irrigation in the foramen makes the tissue well dissected so when i put my finger and go on the facet it is very easy number 2 when i create a passage for the for the cage which i'm going to put later it's very easy it's not a vertical entry for the cage it is more oblique or more a trajectory is better number 3 many of you must have seen when you do a tlif unilaterally the patient comes back with symptoms on the other side why because you are tapped in nuclear material to the other side so what we do when i do this surgery together my colleague is putting the cage and i am putting my scope on the other side where i see the cage coming in i can remove the nucleus which is being pushed out in addition i can irrigate from my side and the preparation of the end plate is better so what we do in short is we combine transforaminal decompression with stabilization now in stabilization i have used sextant i have used viper i have used viper 2 all those uh, routine transpedicular fixations and cages which are expandable etc etc so indications would be primarily deformity in stabbing otherwise no thank you yeah thank you professor and i will read the last oh dr ahmad imron is unmuting now please dr ahmad yeah. imron yeah thank you dr sarbin uh, thank you professor gor for your nice uh, presentation and informative <coughs> presentation uh, is it possible to do this procedure uh, in very short uh, foramen professor uh, no i would be honest enough to tell you one thing uh, commonly the disc height must be above 8 mm if the disc has collapsed beyond 8 that is smaller than 8 mm where you will find you draw a line along the lower end plate of the upper vertebra you will see the sap has gone up in that case doing the surgery is possible but it will need a lot of skill because the area is very small okay number 2 is the good part is in the lower zone that is medial to the pedicle you can do the surgery up to 6 mm of space being available because we have another scope which is 4 mm and we also have what we call as a oversized drill now let me tell you what is that it's something very funny let's say this is the drill okay do you see my pencil yeah. there is a eraser here and this is the tip of the pencil so what we have done we have made this bigger this is 6 mm okay the stem is 3 mm so what i do is i hold my scope and i put my instrument from the patient side towards me so the big part of the drill remains there and the small part comes and then i attach my drill machine now here what i can do is i can drill that foramen with this 6 mm drill which is otherwise not going through the scope you got the point i put it the other way reverse way so i can use a bigger drill and i can then drill the bony walls of the foramen and i can still work but these are tricks which may not be possible in the first surgery for a beginner you can conceptualize it but you may not be able to execute it because there are many things to be held in hand the scope is in the left hand there is a camera attached to it irrigation light cable in the right hand you have the instrument you have to take care of the cannula the patient is awake etc etc so you may need to practice it but it is not impossible and i always tell my friends that if i can do it then you can also do it i mean there is nothing great about it if i can do it you can definitely do it okay thank you professor thank you thank you professor for encouraging us this is probably for the last question uh, i will read it from the chat column from dr dira atman he asked you two question he has problems with l5 s1 transforaminal endoscopy do you have any tips and tricks 
And the uh, second question, can transforaminal endoscopy also be done for T12 and L1 area? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the answer is very simple. For L5, S1, I have a video on the YouTube called as Difficult L5, S1. I would uh, suggest for the want of time for you to go to the YouTube, search the video, Difficult L5, S1. It's about 50 minutes video. You can go through that. It will answer all your questions. And can you do D12L1? Yes. But there is a proviso. You must remember that in many patients, D12L1 is a part of the lumbar curve. I mean, there is no change in the curvature at D12L1 in everyone. In most of them, yes, but not all of them. So if it is not a part of the dorsal curve, but it is a part of the lumbar curve, you can definitely do D12L1. Let me tell you something. We have also done mid-dorsal disc surgeries through the foramen. I have done D8, 9, D7, that is also possible. I mean, once you understand the trajectory and where to land, it is possible even at mid-dorsal area. So, detail L1, yes, definitely. So, can we... Uh, apply it on T12 to L1, thoracolumbar thora lumbar junction. Yes. We can apply it to D12 L1. The only thing which you have to remember is you are dealing with an area which has the conus and not the cauda. So you have to be extremely cautious and you have to be extremely sure where you are landing and where you are working. And there I can tell you patient being under local, uh, awake and aware makes a huge difference. But if you ask me D12L1, definitely. In fact, I can tell you, all of you, all neurosurgeons, please remember, it is very easy to do D12L1 rather than doing all that pediculectomy or drilling the pedicle and then go like this, etc., etc. And you don't have to do a laminotomy. You don't have to do a facet removal. You don't have to destabilize. You don't have to put screws. Nothing. It's very simple. Under local. Thank you so much, Professor Gore. I think uh, we are uh, <laughs> exit the time, but it is very nice and excellent presentation and discussion and explanations. So personally from me, I would like to say thank you to all the speakers and all the panelists, my teachers, my seniors, my colleagues, and all the participants. Uh, I will leave uh, the next session for the closing and announcement to Dr. Lucas Galileo. Thank you. Dr. Lucas, please. Okay, uh, thank you. We thanks Professor Mehmet Jileli, Dr. Satis Chandra Gore, and Dr. Uli Hanafi Dahlan for their remarkable lecture as usual. Also, we thanks Dr. Ahmad Imron, Dr. Muhammad Seiku, Dr. Eko Agus Subagio, <coughs> Dr. Sabri Ibrahim, and Dr. Ajis Tristianto as the panelists and share their knowledge to us uh, in this webinar. Uh, thank you to Dr. Sevin Estetio Pusunggu for guiding to this program very well. We want to remind you that we will have another webinar series on August about uh, from clinical to surgical approach of peripheral nerve entrapment with international and national speaker and panelists. We will spread this registration link soon to all the participant email who has been registered. This is our next webinar. Maybe, uh, we will schedule in September uh, 2021. So, uh, before we end this webinar, we ask all the participants to turn on the video so the, that all the participants in this webinar will take a photo shot. Uh, you can put on your video on so we can take our uh, photo shot to all of you. Dulu, kasih tahu nanti.
Jesus. Come on. 